Good morning. It is 9.35. Today is the Assessment Appeals Board number one. Uh, would Brendan please take roll call? 
Board member Croft. Here. Board member Frino. Present. Board member Sisk. Present. Thank you. All right, let's stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Audience, please remain standing. I'm going to place those of you here in person and those of you on Zoom under oath before you address the board. Please raise your right arm. When you, I complete reading your oath, please state I do. You and each of you do solemnly affirm that the testimony you're about to give and the matters now pending before this board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. You may now be seated. Thank you. Now, whenever Brandon is ready, he will conduct the agenda review. So bear with him, it might take a few. <laughs> we do have several pages, so thank you for your patience. Um, and we do have quite a pe number of people on Zoom. Um, you should not hear your name called. I'll stress that you should not be hearing your name called right now. But if you do hear your name called, please press the raise hand button. Or if participating by telephone, star the nine. Only if you hear your name called. This is going to be to deny and reschedule cases that are not present today. Um, all right, sorry, getting a little bit of feedback, but I'll keep talking. Item 42 is going to be the first on the agenda review. Application number 211299, Applicant Coles Department Stores Incorporated as lessee, removed from the agenda due to submission of a withdrawal. Item number 43, application number 2110788, Applicant Coles Department Stores Inc. as lessee, removed from the agenda due to submission of a withdrawal. Items. Items 44 through 45, application numbers 2210873 and 2210878, applicant Coles Incorporated, removed from the agenda due to submission of a withdrawal. Item 46 and 47, application number 211407 through 211408, continue to May 6, 2024, pending receipt of an original stipulations. Items 48 through 50, applications 2111330 through 2111331 and 2111333, Applicants Home Good Incorporated. Continue to May 6, 2024, pending receipt of original stipulations. Item number 51 through 53, application number 2211344 through 2211346, Applicant Home Goods Incorporated, continue to May 6, 2024, pending receipt of original stipulations. Item numbers 54 through 56, applications 211409 through 211411, Applicant Marshals of California, LLC, continue to May 6, 2024, pending receipt of original stipulations. Items 57 and 58, application numbers 21-11344 and 21-11335. Applicant Marshals of California, LLC, continue to May 6, 2024, pending receipt of original stipulations. Items 59 through 60, application number 22-11344 and 22-11349. Applicant Marshals of California, LLC, continue to May 6, 2024, Penny receipt of original stipulations. Items 61 and 62, application numbers 211412 and 211413. Applicant TJ Maxx of California LLC continued to May 6, 2024, pending receipt of original stipulations. Items 63 and 64, application numbers 211335 and 211337. Applicant TJ Maxx of California, LLC, continued on May 6, 2024, pending receipt of original stipulations. Items 65 and 66, application numbers 22-11350 and 22-11351, applicant TJ Maxx of California, LLC, continued to May 6, 2024, pending receipt of original stipulations. Item 105. Application number 2110872, applicant Rodriguez and Sons Pro as lessor, Garfield Beach CVS LLC as lessee, continued to May 6, 2024, pending receipt of original stipulations. 
Item 107, application number 2210229, applicant Chad H. and Jana Roberts Trust by Chad Roberts. Seeing no one present, deny due to lack of appearance. Item number 114. Application number 2211309, Applicant Salem Radio Properties Incorporated, removed from the agenda due to the submission of a withdrawal. Item 118. Application number 2211438, Applicant J. Paul Wondra, continue to May 6, 2024, pending receipt of original stipulation. Item 119. Application number 2211495, Applicant Greenhawk LLC, continue to May 6, 2024, pending receipt of original stipulation. Item number 120. Application number 2211520, Applicant Martinez John Senior Trust Estate, Richard Martinez, seeing no one present, denied due to the lack of appearance. Uh, item 127. Application number 23-10078, applicant Rod A. Peck, deny due to lack of appearance. See no one present. Item number 128, application number 23-10101, applicant Kevin Voss, deny due to lack of appearance. And again, if you do hear your name called while I'm announcing these for denial due to lack of appearance, please press the raise hand button. Item 130 through 131, application 2310112 and 2310113, applicant MEK Family Trust, denied due to lack of appearance. Item 132, application number 2310381, applicant Z Living Trust, denied due to lack of appearance. Item 133, application number 2310382, applicant John Franz, denied due to lack of appearance. Item 134, application number 2310388, applicant David and Angela Willis, denied due to lack of appearance. Item 135, application number 2310429, applicant Stephen Brock, denied due to lack of appearance. Item 136, application number 2310431, applicant 1387 Fairview LLC, Daniel Toshner, denied due to lack of appearance. Item 139, application number 2310632, applicant Renee H. and Barbara Garcia, denied due to lack of appearance. Item 141, Application number 2310652, applicant Moeen Family Trust, denied due to lack of appearance. Item 142, application number 2310690, applicant Asad Reza, denied due to lack of appearance. Item 144, application number 2310786, applicant Brett Smith, Removed from the agenda due to submission of a withdrawal. And items 145 through 147, application 2310856 through 2310858, David and Ein Scheinfarb Family Trust, denied due to lack of appearance. I do not believe anybody made themselves known for the names I just read, so recommendation is to approve the agenda review as stated. I so move. Second. Thank you. All right. And were there any objections to that motion? All right. Thank you. All right. That completes our agenda review. Do we have any public comments at the moment? I believe everybody in attendance today is for items on today's agenda, which we'll get to shortly, so there are no public comments at this okay. time. Do we have any comments from the board? All right, thank you. Okay, now it is time to roll through our regular agenda to figure out who wants to present their case today or who wants to ask for a postponement. <clears throat> and Chair says just right before you do that, well, since we have a 
quite a number of people who I believe are rescheduling today. I'm just going to let everybody know what their options are going to be. Um, our next hearing is April 8th. However, that's only 21, uh, 28 days away, so that probably won't work for most of you. Um, May 6th is probably going to be the day that most people um, request. That's going to be 56 days away, um, but if you owe any additional information to the assessor, you're likely going to need to provide that to them by April 6th, which is uh, coming up. And then the third option will be June 10th, which is 91 days away. Um, and in that case, you, um, depending on the discussion, you would either need to provide um, any outstanding data by May 5th, or sorry, May 11th, uh, if it's requested 30 days prior, or if you're requested to provide information within the next 30 days, it would be April 10th. So those of you requesting reschedule, please keep in mind which of those dates you would like to request and, and be checking your schedules now so that when we get to you, you know which date works best for you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Sis. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we'll start with our first application, 18-10014, Los Robles Regional Medical Center. And Chair Sisk, we're actually going to be able to cover items 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 through 20, 21, 22, 23, 24 through 26, 27 through 29, 30, 31 through 32, 33 through 35, 36, 37, 38, 39 through 41, all with one action. Um, this is a status hearing on all of the cases. I believe we have Ryan McClure on Zoom. I, and Ryan, I got you unmuted. Is there anyone else from Versatex I need to unmute? Uh, just me this morning. Thank you. Oh, let's see. It looks like we got a problem with the sound. There we go. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Um, all right. So, Chair, this, this is just a status hearing to determine if we are ready to set a special hearing for all of these cases, and it's my understanding that we're not quite ready to set this, the special hearing date yet. Is that right, Mr. McClure? Yes, that's correct. We've had uh, several update calls with the assessor's office, and it looks like we're gonna most likely be able to reach the stipulations on all these appeals. So um, no need for a special hearing to be set just yet. So, Chair Sisk, I'd recommend, uh, well, we can, of course, check in with the assessor as well, but I'd recommend we continue the status hearing to May 6th and then check in if, if a special hearing is needed at that time, given that the parties are still discussing. Um, okay. And I believe I discussed this with you prior, Mr. McClure. May 6th would work for you for a, a subsequent status, correct? Correct. May 6th works. And I want to check with the assessor. Any comments from the assessor's office? Good morning, Brooke Hill, representing the assessor's office. May 6th uh, sounds great to do another status conference. We agree this is likely uh, going to be resolved okay. without a special hearing. Do you need any data, or is everything? I don't order? believe so, no. Okay. So we're just looking for a motion to postpone until May 6th. Uh, before we get into that, I see there is a stipulation for a continuance that was signed. Um, Two of twenty. Do we need any other continuances? Any other stipulations? Are we running into any other deadlines? So, so those are the. That's the history of prior reschedules. So this is getting uh, rescheduled again. Um, but it, um, these are some very old cases going back to the 2014 year. Um, so right now, uh, today's hearing was just for the a check in on the status of progression to see if the parties ready to set a, a date for a special hearing dedicated to this case. Um, and so all we're doing is rescheduling the status hearing to May 6th at this point. Oh, okay. And then we'll check in on May 6th to see if the parties are ready for a, a special hearing or if it's resolved, we won't have to have any hearing at all. Thank you. Okay. I'm, I move we reschedule to the, to uh, what was it? May 6th. May 6th. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. That takes care of items 8 through 41. And we have one more for Mr. McClure while he's on the line. If okay. we just want to jump there, it's going to take another chunk of our agenda out. Um, give me just a second. It's going to be the Bax Alta cases, which I think is just two more pages forward, starting on page 8. <laughs> Item 70. 
Okay. So uh, items 70 through 76, uh, 77 through 83, 84, 85 through 91, and 92 through 98 are also, so this is also a status hearing for Mr. McClure, so I'll turn it back over to him. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, for these appeals, they include both real property and personal property, and we've been making progress with on both sides of the um, assessor's office there, and um, I just also like to request uh, postpone this to May 6th for another status hearing, um, as I think we'll likely be able to resolve these also. Okay, via stipulation. Okay. okay, thank you. Any comments from the assessor's office? Uh, the assessor received uh, some data last week, uh, so we do need additional time to review it. And since we haven't had a chance to fully review what has been sent, we would like to request a proviso that the data be provided within 30 days. And May 6th is, uh, okay. is fine. So 30 days of today or May 6th? 30 days from today. Okay. Looking for a motion to postpone to May 6th with the proviso that any data requested be provided within 30 days of today. So move. I second that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. McClure. You're all set for today. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you. All right. All right. That's going to take us all the way to page seven of our agenda item 67. Oh, yeah. Number 67. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Application 21-10483 and 10484, uh, Joshua 2415 LLC. We have Mona Golastani on Zoom for this item. Thank you. Oh, good morning. Good morning. Are you prepared to move forward today? Uh, we'd like to uh, uh, have the hearing continued. Okay. All right. Any so comments? Yes. Uh, we can go with a May 6th date. Okay. Any comments from the assessor's office? Um, the May 6 is fine. Uh, the assessor has received some data, um, but if we could go ahead and add a proviso um, so we have a chance to review it and see if there's okay. anything else we need. <clears throat> All right. I'm um, looking for a motion to postpone to May 6 with the proviso that any data requested be provided within 30 days of today. So move. I second that. Thank you. And Chair, Thank just, you. just to note for the record, while it does uh, indicate the two years has expired, Ms. Golastani had submitted a two-year waiver after uh, the agenda was uh, sent out, so we do have a waiver on file for this, uh, allowing for today's continuance. Oh, perfect. So Thank we're you. all set. Thank you, Ms. Golastani. You're all set. Thank you. Okay, next application, 21-10601. Jose Rivelas. Mr. Rivelas, please come forward to the podium. Good morning. Good morning. Are you prepared to move forward today? Um, I don't have all the documents because okay. they're asking for taxes of my brothers, uh, 30 years, 35 plus years. I do have mine. They're present here with me to testify that they don't have them. Uh, I'm very new with this procedure, so I'm doing my best to um, resolve this matter. Okay. Uh, 2005, you guys did an assessment and a appraisal. That jumped my prices on this house, so that's why I'm, I'm disputing the uh, the reason of the increase of taxes okay. since we own the house. But I got all my taxes here, my wow. proof of payments, and where I've been the owner of the house since since then. Okay. Any comments from the assessor's office? Uh, the assessor was still requesting uh, data, um, so we would request a proviso. And if uh, Mr. Ravellis, if you could speak with uh, Mr. Phillips before you go to sure. connect on what data he's still looking for, that great. would be great. Okay, um, so we'll postpone this. Do we have a date to postpone it to? May 6th. May 6th. May 6th, for reason, we don't have any more documents to provide. So what will be the reason to reschedule? That's all we have right now at this moment. But again, I'll follow up with May 6th. Um, I take the music uh, after we speak to Joe Phillips about uh, the procedure. Yeah, if if we could do May 6 with a proviso, um, and then y you and Mr. Phillips can work out um, what data is available. Sure. Okay, sounds great. Looking for a motion to postpone to May 6. Yes. Can I make? Uh, you were here about a month ago, weren't right, you? Right, right. Yeah, and we had sort of the same discussion. Correct. And I'm wondering why. We seem to be chasing our tails around now that not that I'm going to vote against a continuance, but 
Are those documents not available at all? Or you're They're not available. We look. I mean, we, we tried our best, but uh, this is 30 plus years at income taxes. So we're, there's nothing that... Nothing to exactly. there's no there's no there there right exactly you mean <laughs> so you, you mean. don't you you just don't have those documents I still don't yeah okay so um, okay so if but I do we don't go through this taxes. third time and look for something that isn't there because uh, I think you said this before right and I don't I think there was maybe some misunderstanding between the sides so if if we can. Hopefully next time proceed with the data we have and both parties can talk and try and figure out what, data, what other data might be available. Sure. Um, the board would appreciate that, or at least I would appreciate that. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay. Thank you. Looking for a motion to postpone to May 6th with the proviso that any data requested by the assessor's office be provided within 30 days. Thank so you. moved. I second. Thank you. Next application 21-10771 and 10772, Best Buy Corporation. And we can also simultaneously uh, handle items 101 through 104 also for Best Buy. We okay. have uh, Catherine Croteau of uh, Best Buy on Zoom. Thank you, Ms. Croteau. Thank you. Um, we are asking for a postponement um, for, all, for, these, for these two matters. Um, we have complied with uh, with the assessor uh, requirements to get information in, but um, it unfortunately was not done by 12-6. So um, I believe the assessor's office is also fine with us. I'm not sure that we need the proviso, but I think we have provided the information um, and we're pending a review. Okay, thank you. Any comments from the assessor's office? The assessor did receive data last week. Uh, we haven't had time to complete our review, uh, so we would like to request a proviso in the event um, there's anything missing within 30 days of today. Okay. And is May 6th okay for both parties? Yes. Yes. Okay. For us as well. Okay, perfect. We are um, looking for a motion to postpone to May 6th with the proviso that any data requested by the assessor's office be provided within 30 days of today. So moved. Second. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Curto. Okay, next item, 21-11476, Neil Gold. We have Mr. Gold by telephone. Please press star then six on your telephone keypad to unmute your telephone. And that's gonna be star then six to unmute. Okay, I'm online. All right, good morning. I'm online. Good morning. Good Thank morning. you for having me. You're welcome. Thank you for attending. Are you prepared to move forward today, sir? No, I'm not. I'm waiting for one document to come in from uh, the attorney that was preparing my uh, trust, and uh, I have yet to receive it because something happened at his office. Okay. Okay. Any comments from the assessor's office? Uh, the assessor agrees a continuance is in order, and we would request a data proviso within 30 days if, if we're going to May 6th. Okay, and are we okay with May 6th? Um, is it okay, can we push it out to June 10 if that's okay with all parties? That's fine with the assessor. Okay, looking for a motion to postpone to June 10th with the proviso that any data requested by the assessor's office be provided within 30 days. So move. Second. Uh, I, I, I agree, sir. Thank okay, you, Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to end the call. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Have a good day. All right. Next application, 22-10576, ATE LLC. We have Adam Tancredi on Zoom for this item. Please unmute. Thank you. Well, good Hello. Morning. Good morning. Are you prepared to move How forward? Are you? I'm, we're doing good. Are you prepared to move forward today, sir? Uh, I am not. I'm actually uh, asking for, hold on, I got it in my email here, uh, requesting an amendment to appeal the base value okay. of this. Yes, Chair Sisk, um, we, I did have a discussion with, with Mr. Tancredi last week. Um, 
He purchased, or uh, the LLC purchased the property September 7th, 2021. Um, so this appeal is eligible to be amended to appeal that. So the requested action before your board would be to approve the applicant's request to amend the application in section six to add the selection of box B2, which is a base value challenge for the September um, 7th, 2021 change in ownership. And so we would need your board's approval to make that amendment. Okay. Do you have any comments from the assessor's office? Uh, the amendment is fine with the assessor, okay. and we, we haven't received any data, so we would request a proviso uh, that it be provided within 30 days. <clears throat> okay. So we need a motion on the amendment, and then we want to postpone it to a different date. So we need two motions? Correct. So if right now is just the amendment, and then if your board approves, then we'll talk about reset. Okay. Looking for a motion to approve the amendment? So move. Second. Thank you. All right. So that's okay. approved. Uh, <clears throat> so a, a continuance of at least 45 days is required for amendments. So that's the May 6th or June 10th date, uh, depending on the preference of the parties. Either one is fine with the assessor. Mr. Yeah, I, either is fine. We've got the appraisals done already. So whatever, whatever works for everybody is fine with me. So you do the May 6th? Okay. Sure. Looking for a motion to postpone to May 6th. Do we need a data so move. Oh, the, the assessor requested the, the appraisal was just emailed on Friday, so okay, so data haven't provider. read it yet. Right. So do you want me to put the data provider in there? Okay. Please. Looking for motion to postpone to May 6th with the proviso that any data request would be provided within 30 days. So move. Second. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, next application. 22-11037, Judy Becerra. Looks like we have Doug Michi on Zoom for this item. I'll allow him to unmute. Good morning, Doug Mickey here. Good morning. Are you prepared to move forward today, sir? Uh, I was advised by the assessor's office that they intended to continue this. I think they're still working on their evaluation of the parent-child exclusion claim. Okay. Any comments from the assessor's office? Uh, the assessor agrees that a continuance is in order. We are um, looking at the Prop 58 claim. Did we need data? And we need data, so okay. we would like to add a proviso. And then do we have a date in mind, May or June? May 6th would be fine. Okay. Works on our side, too. Okay, great. Looking for a motion to postpone to May 6th with the proviso that any data requested by the assessor's office be provided within 30 days. <clears throat> so move. Second. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> okay, next application, 22-11057, uh, Bloom Energy Corporation. I believe we have Ronald Gangloff on Zoom for this item. Yes. That's correct. Well, good morning. Hi, good morning. Are you prepared to move forward today, sir? Uh, no, the applicant would request a continuance on this. We had these are multi multiple location type items, and we got a couple of them resolved. This one kind of snuck by. So I think we have some information due to the assessor, but we'd like to continue this to the June hearing date. Okay, any comments from the assessor's office? Uh, June is fine with the assessor. We would request that the data be provided within 30 days of today. Okay. All right. Looking for a motion to postpone to June 10th with the proviso that any data requested by the assessor's office be provided within 30 days of today. So move. I second. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next application, 22-11133, Mesa Verde Office Park. We have Steve Griffin by telephone. Thank you, Mr. Griffin. Good morning. Good morning. Are you prepared to move Hello. forward today? Uh, no, sir. We'd like to extend to uh, May 6th. Okay. Any comments from the assessor's office? Uh, May 6th is fine. Uh, we would request a data proviso. We have um, received some data, but it was um, past the deadline, and so um, we we'll need a little bit more time to review that. Okay. Looking for a motion to postpone to May 6th with the proviso that any data requested by the assessor's office be provided within 30 days of today. So moved. I second. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Griffin. You're all set. 
<coughs> All thank right. you, board. Appreciate your help. All right, thank you. <laughs> Next application, 22-11282, HSRE Oakmont Camrio LLC. And we can also talk about item 113 is the same property, <coughs> a slightly different owner, um, but they're both um, the same property. Uh, we have Brent Buzzkirk of Altus Group on Zoom for this item. Thank you. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Are you prepared to move forward today? Uh, no, we're going to ask the board if we can reschedule both of these items. Okay. Any comments from the assessor's office? Um, the assessor hasn't received any data, um, okay. so we would request a proviso, and either data is fine. Okay, do you have a date, Mr. Buskirk? Yeah, we would prefer June 10th, if it's okay with everybody. That's fine. Okay, looking for a motion to postpone to June 10th with the proviso that any data requested by the assessor's office be provided within 30 days of today. So move. I second. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Have a good day, sir. All right. Uh, next application, 22-11336, Bright Peninsula Road, LLC. We have Dylan Hoyes of Paradigm Tax Group on Zoom for this item. Hello, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Are you prepared to move forward today? Uh, I believe uh, us and the owners are asking for a uh, continuance. Um, we believe that there's going to be an appraisal completed, probably not in time for, yeah, not in time for the uh, upcoming. Uh, so we, we'd like to extend it out to June 10th to provide uh, further okay. time for that uh, appraisal to be completed. Okay. Um, June 10th. Any comments from the assessor's office? Um, June 10th is fine. Uh, do you think that the appraisal will be available within the next 30 days? Probably that it's possible, um, but uh, I, I can't promise that it, I'll have it by, you know, the next available hearing date. So I think June 10th is probably the best, but I, 30 days, we should probably be able to have it by then, yeah. Okay. Um, 30 and days prior to the hearing date? Could we do 45 <clears throat> days? This is a PI is my understanding, so it's a little bit more complex. So if we could have, um, if we could do 45 days prior, just to give us a little extra time. Okay. Okay, looking for a motion to postpone no. to June 10th with the proviso that any data requested by the assessor's office be provided within 30 days of the hearing date. 45 days of the hearing date. Thank you. 45 days prior, correct? Yes, 45 okay. days prior to the hearing date. <laughs> so move. I second. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Chair, for efficiency's sake, I'm going to say let's skip item 116 for now and go to 117. Okay. All right. Um, application 22-11420, North Shore Health Care, LLC. I, Mr. Buzzkirk, is that you? I don't see anyone else from Altus on the call any longer. Yes, I'm making the appearance on behalf of Christian Tucker. Thank you. Okay. Are you prepared to move forward today on this one? Uh, no, sir. We're actually going to request to have this rescheduled as well. Okay. Any comments from the assessor's office? The assessor hasn't received any data, so we would request a proviso that it be provided within 30 days. And um, June 6th, or June 10th or May 6th is fine with the assessor. Okay. Is June 10th okay? Yeah, June 10th works. Okay. I'm sorry. June 10th works for us. Okay. Looking for a motion to postpone to June 10th with the proviso that any data requested by the assessor's office be provided within 30 days. So move. I second. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Let's see. Okay. Application 22-11638, Robin Steele. We have Robin Steele on Zoom for this item. Thank you. Hi. Good morning. Are you prepared to move forward today? Uh, well, I'd like to say yes, but the answer is no. Uh, the reason is that we are still disputing a second assessment that was applied to the, how, the home. My mother passed away. We inherited it. We appealed the first assessment. We moved it to an LLC. And so we're working through those details with Brendan and Scott. So we need a little more time to finish that. Okay. Any comments from so the assessor's postponing. office? Yes. Any comments from the assessor's office? Um, it, 
it's the assessor's understanding that there was an amendment needed to this application, um, although my notes don't indicate exactly what the amendment yeah, was. Th there's a lot of complications with the multi-transfers, so the applicant needs to discuss with uh, the assigned appraiser, Scott Bradley, a little more before we determine okay. what amendments are necessary. It's not as uh, cut and dry as we would have hoped because of the LLC involvement. Um, so the applicant's going to meet with Scott and Mr. Bradley, and then um, amendment may be necessary at a later time, but at this point there's too many unanswered questions to know for certain if, if we're ready for that, so. Okay, well, <laughs> given that, do, do we wanna meet on April 8th to discuss whether or not an amendment is necessary? Um, because if an amendment is necessary, then that would extend it out another 45 days. So I don't wanna push it out too far, um, so hopefully we can resolve it quickly. Does that work for the applicant? Well, my only concern is that I feel like I'm bouncing back and forth between Brendan and Scott to try and figure out what we need to do. Perhaps the three of us could jump on a call and come to some decision, and then I would be okay with the April 8th time frame. Yeah, um, Does that make sense? I'll reach out to Mr. Bradley and work out a time where we can all get on the phone together and, and figure this out. I appreciate it. Thank you. So should we go for April 8th or should we wait till May 6th? Worst case scenario, April 8th, we do another extension, but hopefully everything is clarified to where if an amendment is necessary, it can be approved on April 8th. Okay, I'm good with that. I appreciate it. Thank you. So we're going to postpone this to April 8th? Yeah, I'm not sure if there's outstanding data the assessor is requesting. Um, there is. <laughs> but it depends because we don't know. But it depends on <laughs> on how, on whether or not we need to amend the application on what would be needed. So, um, if we can just agree that April eighth will be a discussion on whether an amendment is needed, I think we could just wait until then for any um, data provisos, and we'll be. In Are contact. you referring to the amendment to make the decision on the eighth? Because I believe I've sent you pretty much all the paperwork that we have. So is it just simply the amendment that we need to discuss? On the 8th. Is that what you're getting on? On yeah. the 8th, yes. And then and then we will discuss prior to with um, Mr. Vlahakas and Mr. Bradley. Okay, that sounds good. I'll wait to see the dates that work for you, both you gentlemen, and I'll, I'll make myself available. So thank you. Okay, so we're postponing this till April 8th with no data proviso because it's not enough time. Correct. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, looking for a motion to postpone until April 8th. And this is just on the, if there's a need for an amendment or not, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. basically it's going to be said, there's there's a multiple transfers and LLCs involved, and so that's why it's, right. we, we tried to work with the, uh, to work it out, but there's a lot of complications to do it over the last few days, so I think it's basically going to be a status. Can they amend okay. or, or not amend. can they not amend? And then where do we go from there? Okay. So move. I second. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you, Ms. Steele. You're all set. Okay. Next application. Look, we have two in a row. 22-11653 um, and 11654 um, on the Rise Properties LLC. Yeah, and also 20, 124 and 125, yeah. same applicant. Different year, we have Carl Lindner of Assessment Canceling Services on Zoom for this item. Thank you, Mr. Lindner. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good Mr. morning. Clark, members of the board. Are you prepared to move forward today? Um, actually, I just wanted to check in with the assessor here because it's my understanding that they made this correction back in October, and nothing has been changed on my client's side as far as billing or refunds. So I would love to get some clarification on that. Okay. Any comments from the assessor's office? Uh, the assessor hasn't received any data on this case, so I'm not um, sure what change we're talking about. Um, but I would recommend um, that the applicant reach out to Mr. Phillips uh, to discuss the case after the hearing today uh, to to determine. Um, well, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but we actually, I mean, we've already received a notice of assessment enrollment change. Okay. Uh, it was a sales price issue that we cleared up 
with Mr. Phillips. And I'm just curious. Uh, it looks like I have the notice from you guys. I'm just curious as to why it's been five months and the bills haven't changed. So that's not under the jurisdiction of this board. So if you've received notice of assessment rule correction and are satisfied with those um, assessments, that would be as far as this board could take it. Any refund questions are under the jurisdiction of the county auditor controller, and you'd have to discuss with their office any refund. But that would uh, not be within this board's jurisdiction to discuss the, the refunds. Um, if you want to... Um, you can reach the auditor for a refund status at AUDPTAX at Ventura.org, um, and they can answer any refund questions you have. Um, okay. Uh, I would ask that uh, to protect my client's rights, I am a little paranoid a little bit, I have to be honest. Uh, if we could just postpone this hearing, and then the second I see that it's been processed by the auditor, I'll withdraw it. Okay. Um, I, I do know they are... Um, Probably not in issuing any refunds until June. So do we want to continue it to June just to be safe? I'm acceptable to that. And if I haven't gotten anything by then, I'll just put in the paperwork so we don't have to go through this again. Okay, any comments from the assessor's office? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what the disconnect is here. Um, I would... Um, still recommend the applicant reach out to Mr. Phillips and we would still request a data proviso um, because I, I, I'm looking at Mr. Phillips and he is um, is not aware of the role correction that, that the applicant is speaking of. So we would right. request a data proviso just in the event um, there is still an outstanding issue uh, under appeal. Okay, thank you. Looking for a motion to postpone to June 10th with the proviso that any data requested by the assessor's office be provided within 30 days. So move. I second. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lindner. You're all set. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, next application 23-10013, Robert Pardum. We have Mr. Purdom on Zoom for this item. Uh, please press star then six on your telephone keypad to unmute. Again, star then six. Mr. Purdom, thank you. Yeah. Hello. Can you Good hear me? Good morning. Yes, we can. Are you prepared to move forward today, oh. sir? Oh, okay. I am. Give me my folder on this one. Oh. Yes, sir. Hello. Are you prepared to move forward today? I am. Um, okay. Do we have any comments from the assessor's office? Uh, the assessor is not prepared to move forward today. Um, we're still waiting on some data, uh, specifically repair costs. Um, so we would request a continuance with a data proviso that the data be provided within 30 days of today. Okay. So then the May 10th? That would be or fine. Or 6th, I mean. Okay. So do you understand that they're still waiting on a little bit of data from you, sir? Um I sent all, I sent most of the data, but I'm going to be out of country in uh, May 10th. I won't even be where there's phone reception. Okay. What about June uh, 10th? Would you be back in? I feel like the 20th. Well, June 10th. June 10th is fine with the assessor. Yeah. That's okay. That would be fine. Okay. Um, well, we, we sent can... all that information to them that I wanted. I bought. Okay, they still need a little okay. bit of information from you. We, we did receive data on Sunday, so we haven't had time to review oh, it Okay, yet. <laughs> so it may or may not be enough. Okay. Looking for a motion to postpone to June okay. 10th with the proviso that any data requested by the assessor's office be provided within 30 days. So move. I second that. <laughs> All right, thank you. So they'll be reaching out to you for some data, and then um, hopefully you guys can work this out before we get together in June. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you. Have a great day. Next application, 23-10107, Javed Atami Ramche. No one has checked in for this item, I do not believe. If you're on Zoom for this item, please press the raise hand button. If participating by telephone, please press star then nine. If you're in person, please come forward to the podium. I do have some unidentified callers, but no one is raising their hand. Um, all right. Um, all right. Seeing no one 
Go to my notes. Say I called. I also tried contacting the applicant last week and left uh, two voice messages at each of their phone numbers. Received no response. Um, so we have no um, indication if they'd be here today to not, or not. Recommendation is to deny due to lack of appearance. All right. So move. I second. Thank you. The next application, item 137, it's application 23-10591, Dennis McDermott. I believe they're in person. Please come forward to the podium. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Can you state your name for us, please? Dennis McDermott. All right, are you prepared to move forward today? Uh, no. The assessor needs a little bit more time to process the claim. If it's possible, I'd like to reschedule till May 6th. Any comments from the assessor's office? Um, May 6 is fine. Um, there is a Prop 19 claim in process. Uh, we would request a data provido, proviso in the event um, there's any additional information we need to process the claim. Okay. So we're looking for a motion to postpone <coughs> to May 6 with the proviso that any data requested by the assessor's office be provided within 30 days. So move. I second. All right. Thank you. Real, okay, real, thank you. real quick. Yeah. Uh, hold on. Just a second. Let me... Document that. You said you're Mr. McDermott, correct? Yes, sir. Okay, and this case indicates you're represented by John Barlow, but he's not present today, is that correct? He's not present today. Okay. On May 6th, so normally it would be Mr. Barlow that would attend the hearing. So for May 6th, if this is not resolved, will Mr. Barlow be available to present the case, or are you going to present the case yourself? Mr. Barlow will be here. Okay. Uh, He's leaving town, but he'll be not till after the case, not till after the Okay. Hearing. I just wanted to make sure since it indicated somebody else was handling the case. Sure. Thank you for that. Then you're all set. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Next application, 23-10598, Silvano Garcia. Yes, we have Mr. Garcia by telephone. Please press star then six on your telephone keypad. Star then six on your telephone keypad. Uh, this uh, no confirmation of appearance was received at least 30 days prior to today's hearing. So Mr. Garcia is required by your board's rules to request a reschedule to a later date and um, provide data to the assessors. So given that a reschedule is required, um, Mr. Garcia, I see you're by telephone. So our, our dates are going to be May 6th or June 10th. Did you have a preference between those two dates? Probably June 10th. And then if you want okay. to check with Any comments with the, from the assessor's office? Um, June 10th is fine. Uh, if we could also request a data proviso. Okay. Looking for a motion to postpone to June 10th with the proviso <clears throat> that any data requested by the assessor's office be provided within 30 days. So move. I second. Re real, Thank you. Real quick, Mr. Garcia, since, since you, um, did you get our prior communications regarding today's hearing and the requirements <laughs> to submit paperwork at least 30 days prior? Um, no, I was, okay. was not able to submit it on the prior tw 20, 21 days. Okay. Uh, I just want to make I sure. Wa I wasn't aware of it. Okay. Within the next 30 days, you need to, so if, you need to provide information to the assessor. So make sure you reach out to them later this week to discuss. Um, okay. Do you need okay. any information on how to contact the assessor? Uh, yes. Okay, you're going to give them a call at 805-654-2181. Again, that's 805-654-2181. And he should speak with Ms. Ramirez, correct? And ask for Audrey Ramirez. She's the appraiser assigned to your case. Okay? Okay. Yeah, you should have received some communications, so we just want to make sure you get those going forward since it doesn't look like you had got them. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, I will. Right. Any any other questions before we let you go? Um, no, I think that's... Right. Thank you. Have a good day. I don't have any questions. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you, Chair Sisk. I just wanted to make sure we close that communication gap. No problem. Okay. So next application is 23-10636, Nicola Morini-Bianzino. 
believe. Do we have anyone present for this item? We had received some emails. I'm gonna recommend we trail this. We, we received some emails uh, indicating potential emergency, but no further details. Um, that was this morning, so I need to follow up. So I'd recommend we trail this and come back to it at the end of the day. Okay, no problem. Um, item 143, application 23-10779, uh, Rui Heim. We have Mr. Heim on Zoom for this item. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Good morning. Are you prepared to move forward today, uh, Good sir? morning. Are you prepared to move uh, forward today? No. We're, um, I was expecting some stipulations to come in and, uh, so we need a postponement. Okay. Um, any comments from the assessor's office? Um, the assessor would request a data proviso on this one. Okay. And either date is fine. Okay. And then, um, Mr. Heim, do you have a date in mind? Either um, uh, May 6th or June 10th? Uh, May 6th is fine. Okay. Okay, we're looking for a motion Oops. to postpone. Order. Excuse me. Uh, Tony Freno, Assessment Board. Uh, now, you mentioned that you're expecting some stipulations. In your mind, has this case been resolved? I, I believe we've come to an agreement, but uh, I was speaking with Audrey Ramirez on Thursday of last week, and uh, she was going to send me the stipulation paperwork to sign and return, uh, but it hasn't come yet. Um, she said she may not get it by today, so to request a continuance. Audrey Ramirez with the assessor's oh. office. Uh, that is correct. We spoke on Thursday. Um, I just needed a uh, confirmation of the date um, that the hearing was going to be moved to. We did receive data, so we don't technically need the um, data proviso. It just was received late. Um, so that's why we're requesting the continuance, just to allow time um, for him to receive the stipulation, uh, approve it, and get it back to our office. So you don't need the proviso for additional information? No, we've already come to an agreement of value. It just previously uh, hadn't received it. We, we got the information about um, within the last week and a half or so. OK, thank you. Okay, so we want to postpone it with no data proviso with the assumption you'll sol solve this. Okay, awesome. looking for a motion to postpone to May 6th. So move. I second. Thank you. My apologies for the confusion on that one. It's okay. All right. All right. Um, we're not quite ready for item 148 yet because I, those haven't been routed to county council yet, but if you want to go to item 151 and approve the regular stipulations those were routed to your board uh last uh thursday for review and recommend action is to approve the stipulations did everyone have a chance to review them okay looking for a motion to approve so move i second <clears throat> thank you uh, brendan joe phillips with the assessor yeah. um, we had mr burnett with item 149 come to our counter today I believe he wanted okay. to speak about the item 149. 149, okay. Is he there present? Yeah, he's in the okay. audience. Okay, so go ahead and come forward. Um, this is an agreement to resolve the case, but it has, um, it's here on my desk. Um, we got it this morning and it hasn't been routed to the assessor, I mean, to the board's attorney or, or the board yet. Um, so while the rest of the hearings are going on today, those will be routed. Um, so uh, please state your name and go ahead with your comments. Good morning, board. My name is James Bovard. Barbara Burnett is my life partner. Okay. Well, good morning. And then you had some comments for us or? Yes, good morning. Well, first of all, I'd like to apologize for my parents. I wasn't even planning on being here for this. Um, well, uh, we're having a little bit of a hard time uh, coming to the fact that we think this assessment of the, of the vessel that we own um, 
or partially owned with the bank, uh, is quite steep. And uh, we, we feel it's not fair because it was assessed in 22. I bought it in 19. I understand COVID made everything go up and down as far as values of things, but that seems like it's one-sided. What happens to the individual yeah. where monetary things don't move when you're on a fixed income? It's, it's extremely hard to, to swallow the, the assessment that we have to pay every year. It's, it's pretty steep. And um, I'm just appealing it to see if we can't get a, a true uh, assessment on the value of the vessel because it's, I've looked at myself on the different websites and it seems like the, the mean value is in the mid thirties, okay? Low, low to mid thirties. I've seen them low as like 25 to 40 for the used vessel of, of what I have. And there's many configurations you can have on these boats. You can have them with or without the lounger, without their fish tanks. So, I mean, Mr. Bouvard, can I stop you? It sounds yeah. like you're getting into the details of your case. So yeah. the board before it today has an agreement signed by Ms. Burnett that reduces the value for 2022 to $50,200. Um, that's going to be routed to the board shortly for their review. I've, I've just handed a copy to the board's counsel. Um, are you saying you no longer agree with the agreement that was signed to reduce it to 50200 Well, yeah, that, that was signed and scanned into the system. And then last week I received an email saying, well, hey, we have to have a printed copy. Well, we, I, we were out of town. We got back in town yesterday. I printed it last night. We discussed it. And she says, well, if it is what it is, it is. But, you know, we, we still don't agree with it. But if we have to, we have to. That's just plain, simple fact, the way it is. But I, I do have a, her signed. She's the one that filed for us. Okay, I have her signed copy right here. Um, I can turn it in and lay down and take it, but we don't agree with it. It's, it's just. So to clarify, and county council president, her signature on there is an agreement that that should be the value for 2022. So you're saying she signed it. After she signed it, she changed her mind. Well, we discussed it. Excuse me, We Brendan. discussed it. Go either way. Before we get into that, are you on title? Do you yes, sir, I am. You I are was, on title. I on was the a primary boat. purchaser of the boat. So you do, you do have the right to 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 represent the, the, the case on the valuation. <clears throat> as far as the, uh, the board goes, you're under no duress to take that stipulation the Sessions office has offered it to you. Uh -huh. You have to make that decision just right. like any other court case. Is it worth my trouble to drop it 5000 10000 or maybe even get it higher? That's yours and and Miss um, Burnett's decision. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to approve a stipulation that you, you really sort of feel you signed in duress, but then you have to be willing to go ahead and present your case. Well... <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm, I'm, I may misspeak here, but I do remember seeing an email that came through. I wish I had a copy of it. It seemed like the, the boat was valued at, uh, from the board around 37 or 39,000. And then I see this one here for over 50. I'm going, oh, wait a minute. What's, what happened here? Again, we're, at this point, we're not hearing the case. Right. We're just trying to find out do you want to? Turn in that stipulation, in which case you go home, or do you want to come back at a different time and you want to withdraw that stipulation? I mean, that's all we can hear now. Do you approve okay. that stipulation or withdraw that stipulation? I'd like to withdraw it at this time. Brendan, is that possible? I assume so, that's possible. Um, I don't. So this hearing was actually scheduled for January 22nd, and they did not attend. It was only rescheduled today for the original to come in, so they should have attended on January 22nd, but we need to defer to county council um, since there was already a signed agreement on any advice or if we need to trail this till later. The speaker at the podium has indicated that um, they're rethinking the wisdom of entering into the stipulation and um, I was handed a Xerox copy of the stipulation and I signed it before the full presentation today. I think under the circumstances, this matter should be continued to one further hearing 
to confirm one way or another with Ms. Burnett if she's withdrawing her consent or if they wish, you know, and they wish to go forward with a litigated hearing or if they wish to abide by the stipulation for the value at 50200 All right. So based on county council's advice, we would... Yeah, it continue. makes sense to, you know, postpone it. And, yeah, if you want to hear it, yeah. Absolutely. Um, Just out of curiosity, what happens if one party agrees and the other party doesn't agree? If they're both on title, I would presume that both need to consent to a stipulation. Okay, thank you. Okay, so do we need to vacate that, um, with well, the stipulation? How do we do that? The board has not approved it, so I'd oh, okay. say your board, so the, the action for your board was just because they didn't um, ever turn in the original to approve the fax copy um, otherwise, this would have been closed back in January. So no action by your board is required given county council's advice. It's just you're taking no action on the stipulation, and it I, sounds like you're um, approving a continuance to a later date. Um, yeah, if that's what if we want to not approve the stipulation, then yeah, then we'll go back to a continuance, and then you could come in and plead your side. <clears throat> so is there a date, in particular date, that would work better for you? Sir? Um, I'm due to have sol shoulder surgery tomorrow. I'll be incapacitated for uh, up to six weeks. So if we could make it in, I heard some uh, of another meeting in June. Is that possible? June 10th, yeah. Your options are on the screen, so June 10th. June, please. Okay, so we'll postpone this to June 10th. Does the assessor need any data or anything or? It doesn't look like it. Um, I'm. I was looking in the folder. The appra the assigned appraiser is not here today. Um, but I can see that obviously we had enough to do a stipulation. Um, if we could add a data proviso, just in case there's anything else we would want, if we were preparing for a hearing, um, okay, uh, we can let the applicant know in the next week if, okay. if there's any additional information needed. Okay, sounds good. Looking for a motion to postpone to June 10th with a. Provide so that any data requested by the assessor's office be provided within 30 days. So move. I second. Thank you. Just just Thank to you. just to clarify, so that you come back. I know this is a new procedure for you. If you come back, what we would be looking for, and you, if you say it's not worth the fifty thousand, just like if you were trying to sell me the boat, um, here's the data I have to support my valuation. These this boat sold, or this is why I don't think. You know, sometimes when you're new to this, you tend to sort of wander on, like, oh, it's got this, it's got that. We really need hard data, and so that's my advice to any applicant that comes in. Well, the question I have, um, <clears throat> it was presented to me earlier that the value of the boat is being assessed, not when I bought the boat, but it was being assessed after the fact and so in 22. Right, so this appeal is not for your purchase price. It's for the market value of the vessel as of January 1st, 2022. So that's what you have to submit evidence for, and you have the burden to show the market value of this vessel and what it would hypothetically have Back sold in 22. January 1st, 2022. Okay, that's why I was ignorant to that fact of what I have to look for, so thank you. May I chime in. Yes. Um, I think it might be beneficial. The assigned appraiser is Mike Gillinger. He is out today. Um, mm -hmm. But Mr. Vernon, uh, Joe yes. Vernon in the back, is also um, very well versed in boat appraisal. Uh -huh. um, I think it would be beneficial if you could speak to him um, after the board uh, makes their motion and, and he'd be happy to go over um, kind of the mechanics of, of what right. we're looking at. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you to the board. You all have a good day. Okay. Did we have that seconded? Uh, yes, yeah, that motion passed. It's been okay, rescheduled great. to yeah. June 10th, but the applicant required to provide the assessor any additional data in the next 30 days. Who, who has the burden of proof in, in that? It's a vessel, so the applicant has to prove the assessor's value is incorrect. If, if the applicant lives on that vessel, does he, is the burden shift? Does it become owner occupied? <laughs> uh, that's a question we had to address at the hearing. Oh. Uh, they do not live on the vessel. They live in Newberry Park. Oh, okay. Right. I can clarify. I'm a 100% disabled veteran. Oh, okay. If I lived on the boat, we wouldn't have this conversation, but we, I don't. I'm you know, totally honest about it, you know. I was, so, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you, the uh, item one sixteen. <laughs> Back to where one sixteen is at Amazon. Yes, Mr. Yes. Paul Yanisky, if you want to come forward to the podium real quick. <clears throat> uh, good morning to the honorable board. Good morning. Good morning. Are you prepared to move forward today? I am. Okay. And the assessor's office, are you prepared to move forward today? Yes. Uh, the assessor is prepared to move forward, and our presentation should take about an hour. Okay. And how long will your presentation take? I would assume about the same. Okay. And um, we, when we typed last week, you weren't sure. Are you requesting written findings of fact today? Uh, I would like to, yes. Okay. So findings of fact will be requested by the applicant. Um, so if your board would like to take a break till 1045, we'll get set up for this first Yes. Meeting. And then do we also have, there's another one we had trailed. Yeah. Uh, I'll, while this next hearing is going on, I'll take care of our two outstanding items that were trailed. Um, there's one of them is we got some emails about a potential emergency but lack of details so I'm going to follow okay. up on that okay, while sorry. we're hearing the first case okay, and then the <laughs> second one is another um, non-original stipulation that needs approval but um, I haven't had time to review that or hand it to county council yet so um, we'll do that while the first hearing is ongoing and take care of those two items at the end of the day. Rather than 1045 can we make that 10-2? Uh, 10 10 we need a little bathroom break. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to adjourn for 10 minutes. <clears throat> thank you. All right, thank you.
Okay, it is um, 10.55 and we are back on the record. All right, um, I've handed out a copy of today's application, um, which is a supplemental assessment for the October 1st, 2021 change in ownership. Um, I'll clarify this up front because it confused me at first. The applicant is Amazon.com Services LLC, as shown on the applicant, but the property owner for the change of ownership is Cancela Properties 2 LLC. So it's been clarified Amazon is filing as a party affected, uh, which they're allowed to do if they were responsible for payment of the supplemental property taxes. Um, because it was a purchase um, and the purchase price is being challenged, the applicant has the burden of proof and the applicant's exhibit one has been submitted to the board. Um, and sorry, I'm just noticing, uh, Mr. Polyansky, on the bottom of this exhibit, it says uh, confidential. Just to clarify, everything presented to the board today is public record and is available to the public to review and copy upon inspection. So um, that confidential disclaimer there um, will be um, not considered. I just want to make sure that was clear. Did you have any questions on that? That's fine. Thank you. Okay. Um, so then we're good to go unless the board wanted an overview from the assessor. Uh, yes, board member Freeno. Yes, just to clarify, uh, Amazon is, is filing the appeal. Now, has, is the ownership still in uh, Dubois' name? Or did it transfer after this to Amazon? Or so Bridget Amazon? Dubois is an employee of Amazon. So if you look at the on page three, the notice of supplemental assessment, you'll see that was issued to Cancela Properties to LLC. Uh, and so I don't know if the assessors got an answer to that question. Um, as long as Amazon was responsible for payment of the taxes, um, for the supplemental, they have appeal rights as a party affected, so um, it wouldn't. I just wonder if this was a case where somebody bought it and then sold it to Amazon or sold it to another entity, or if they still own it. I, Mr. Polyansky, and I apologize, I'm probably mispronouncing. I, I will dive into yeah. that, yeah. Uh, or I could explain it right now if you'd like. Sure, why we've got an arm line. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we're, we're a tenant in the building. Uh, the property was uh, purchased by an investor, and uh, uh, property taxes are paid by Amazon. Okay, okay, and then that investor still owns the property. We, that is correct. Okay. Yes. So we don't we don't have any hidden second sales or something that we should be aware of. Uh, not, not to my knowledge, no. Okay, thank you. That's okay. It. So I believe the applicant has a burden of proof. Is that correct? That's what I've been told. Yes. Okay. Um, does the assessor's office want to give us a short over, a short brief or overview? Sure. I'm Zachary Clifford with the assessor's office. Uh, the overview is the uh, the nature of the appeal is the applicant is disputing that the sale price of 128 million on October 1st, 2021, was fair market value at the time of transfer, and we also conclude that Amazon is the um, is the affected party considering they pay the property tax. So uh, we're in agreement there. Uh, the property is a 290,000 plus a square foot building with a 195,000 square foot parking structure uh, located on the corner of 118 and Madera Road. Uh, the property is located on 43 and a half acres with a substantially less usable space. Uh, and it was formerly a corporate office building and subsequently renovated to uh, provide logistical support for the for Amazon or the tenant as an as a industrial building. Uh, it was previously sold at auction for 16 million on May 5th, 2020, and the then the buyer um, acquired a conditional use permit to change the zoning to, uh, to permit for warehouse and distribution uses. Uh, and then it was in turn renovated and leased and subsequently sold. And that's ge a general overview. Okay. Did you say 16 million or 60 million? One six, 16 million. Okay, I think we're all set. Um Mr. Pravlyansky, whenever you want to present your case.
<clears throat> All very good. Um, again, thank you for your uh, time. Uh, indeed, the subject property uh, is a uh, 290,000 square foot um, uh, former office property that has been uh, repurposed uh, for, uh, as an industrial building. Um, it's loca located at uh, 400 National Way, just um, on, the, uh, on the north <coughs> boundary of uh, Simi Valley. Uh, the ground floor of the property is, is essentially has been converted to uh, warehouse use. The upper level, <clears throat> which formerly used to be office area, uh, right now is still vacant space. It's blocked off. Uh, it has been <clears throat> um, uh, for lack of a better word, disabled. Uh, it, without a substantial investment, it cannot function as, as an office. Um, <clears throat> I'll point your attention to uh, page two of the supporting documentation that's provided. Um, uh, just to give you um, a little bit of history on this property, um, the property sold on 520 um, for 16 million. It was marketed as a... Um, as a, as a project to be uh, re, uh, uh, re redone. And uh, <clears throat> ultimately, uh, it sold for essentially land value. Um, uh, the buyer did not uh, uh, anticipate to revive the building. Uh, to its current use or former use. Uh, there's been a number of um, multiple uh, uses and um, redevelopment options presented. Uh, none of them worked out. Uh, subsequent to the first sale of 16 million, uh, Amazon and the uh, former owner uh, reached a consensus to extend the life of the building by repurposing the uh, the ground floor from office to warehouse, uh, and that has been done at a substantial cost. Uh, additionally, uh, there has been uh, uh, attachments uh, made to the building, uh, particularly the canopy uh, under which uh, vehicles drive, and that has been done in order to protect uh, the uh, delivery drivers from uh, weather elements, whether it's sun or rain, uh, and protect the packages that that um, uh, that are uh, delivered from this property. Uh, just to put things in perspective, um, uh, this is uh, what, what is known as a last mile building, and so Amazon, throughout Amazon's logistical network. There are uh, facilities known as a fulfillment center. That's where items are stored, uh, packaged, uh, and shipped. Uh, from the fulfillment center, uh, packages are then uh, taken to uh, what's known as a sortation building, where packages are sorted based on either the zip code or location where they will ultimately go. And then um, those packages then arrive to the subject property, which is known as a delivery station. And then from the delivery station, they go to the ultimate customer address. So Excuse me, I didn't hear the, the name of the building in between the fulfillment center. Sortation. Sortation? Yeah, sorting. Oh, okay. Yeah, so uh, it is what it sounds like. Um, Thank you. Yeah, uh, basically packages are sorted to optimize delivery uh, routes. Um, <coughs> so if... <laughs> If packages are, are going to Simi Valley, all, everything's going to go to Simi Valley instead of surrounding areas. That's to limit the number of uh, vehicle uh, vehicles on the road and and and, uh, and routes. And so this building is what's known as last mile, meaning the last building uh, before the uh, the product or the uh, uh, delivery item uh, is is 
um, sorted before going to the uh, to the customer's address or business address, home, home or business address. Um, <clears throat> And so, uh, as such, uh, again, from logistical perspective, uh, larger uh, semi trucks come in uh, with bigger shipments. Uh, inside of the building, the the packages are further sorted to uh, to be placed into bins, uh, approximately the size uh, where each bin or one to two bins will fit into a delivery van, and you may, may have seen those on the road, um, and then those delivery vans will, will further take the item. So that's, that's the purpose and function of the building. Um, uh, there is not a whole, there's a little bit of uh, material and handling equipment uh, inside the building. Um, that, that is so that uh, employees don't carry boxes, they're just uh, on rollers. Um, and then, um, and then there are self-propelled uh, cages that, that where packages are placed that we roll out to the delivery vans. Um, so that's what the property is uh, used for and utilized. And then, so subsequently uh, to the first sale after the remodel, uh, the property sold for one hundred and twenty-eight million dollars. Um, <clears throat> And, and that's, that's the, uh, um, the bigger question today before us, whether $128 million represents uh, fair market value of the real estate or fair market value of real estate and something else, intangible value or the value of the lease. And I'm... Um, based on the evidence provided, based on the market data, uh, it is clearly uh, a case where, in fact, this is probably one of the better cases that I've seen where a, a large, substantial, uh, intangible value is attributable to, to the lease over and above the value of the underlying real estate. <clears throat> As such, on page two, uh, towards the bottom of the page, there are... Um, Three approaches of value that were employed, uh, cost approach, uh, sales or market approach, and income approach. Uh, the issues uh, of concern to us is um, that the lease, so uh, if you notice, the property uh, sold for essentially land value for $16 million on 5 2020. And then just about a year later, uh, it sold for 120. That's a huge increase in 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 value. And the way we were, uh, the former owner was able to achieve that, is by uh, agreeing to Amazon's terms of fast tracking the construction. Uh, um, and so. Uh, in general, Amazon pays uh, uh, a premium to complete uh, construction projects quickly because our ultimate goal is not investment in real estate but to uh, deliver packages efficiently, uh, uh, um, shorten the delivery times, uh, uh, minimize the, uh, <clears throat> uh, by minimizing the cost of delivery, uh, Etc. And so we pay a premium in order for the real estate to uh, one uh, function the way uh, uh, our uh, logistical network requires us to uh, for, uh, to optimally uh, provide <coughs> uh, deliveries. And um, in this case, uh, it required a retrofit, which is. Uh, uh, an application for change of use from office to industrial, and the actual work to be done in a, in a very quick manner. And so that, that was a premium that was uh, uh, paid in order to get that done. Um, <clears throat> and so just, just like I wrote uh, down here on, on, on item number one, the lease or the cost of the lease includes fast track retrofitting of former office building and adding uh, temporary 
temporary, temporary above market improvements, uh, which is a large canopy. We don't see um, industrial buildings with large canopies very often. Um, it also included a uh, demo of former offices on the first floor uh, page. Um, and ultimately all that cost was added to the lease and then the lease rate was backed into based on that cost. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, the second issue that's quite important, uh, the lease was then sold to an investor uh, based on uh, a number of factors. Well, first of all, uh, all of Amazon leases sell for a premium uh, because Amazon is considered tier one uh, tenant. Uh, the likelihood of, of going dark is minimal. And, uh, and so that's, that's uh, impacting the uh, uh, quality of the uh, of the of the lease and the risk associated with the lease. So, if I may uh, direct your attention to page three. So, this is uh, again confirmation of uh, when when the property sold in 2020 for 16 million. Uh, it was then on page four and five. Um, it was uh, re revalued at, at, the, at the purchase price, uh, assuming that all value is attributable to uh, the underlying real estate. Uh, page six gives you a, a regional map of where the property is located. As I was saying, it was kind of north of Simi Valley or just north of 118 Freeway. Um, again, north of Thousand Oaks. Uh, page seven is a location map uh, showing a, a better or more precise location where the property is, uh, is located. Uh, on page eight, uh, this is an aerial photograph of, of the property. <clears throat> um, it's very difficult to see it uh, on this picture, but um, the topography on, on this lot is very, um, uh, for lack of a better word, irregular. Uh, it sits on the top of a hill and much of the uh, surrounding uh, uh, areas or areas surrounding the property uh, outside of the parking areas um, is, is very steep. And I'll, I'll have some photographs um, uh, to, to illustrate that. Um, since the property was uh, previously used as, a, as an office building. Um, there is a parking structure, a, uh, a four-story or three-story plus ground floor um, a parking structure on the north uh, portion of the lot. That parking structure is actually, um, it actually supports the building immediately north of the subject property that sits on a different lot. It is also, uh, I believe it's still occupied by Bank of America or, or some other financial institution. And uh, currently, uh, uh, we as Amazon do not have <clears throat> right to utilize or um, uh, or change uh, this, this parking lot. Um, and, and furthermore, it supports um, the overall economic unit of the adjacent or northern lot. And we'll, we'll look at it um, a little bit further down the road. Um, page nine uh, is, is showing uh, essentially a closer up view of of building footprint of, of 147,650 square feet. And then the second floor is a little bit less. It has uh, a number of skylights that kind of uh, extend from ground floor all the way to the ceiling. Um, and then the canopy to the left 
uh, or um, yeah, to the left on the left hand side of the image. Uh, that's the new item that's been added at approximately 24,000 square feet. And then the parking garage is on the right hand side with a bridge uh, for pedestrian crossing um, over to the building uh, immediately to the north. In this case, it's to the right. Um, page 10 uh, shows uh, two items. The first is the flat map on top. Uh, the bottom is a site plan, and this is a site. The site plan illustrates uh, an easement that neither Amazon nor any future uh, user of the subject property would be able to uh, uh, easily uh, uh, utilize. It, all of that parking, including the parking structure, is for and attributable to the office building to the north. And that is uh, kind of sh shown in light uh, dashed um, section um, kind of north of the, of the image. <clears throat> On page 11, again, this is uh, to illustrate the topographical uh, or uh, basically topography of, of the lot. And as, as you can see, even the upper more or less level uh, areas are not uh, so level because the building sits on a, on a sloping um, on a sloping hill. <clears throat> on page 12, and I'll, I'll go through a number of photographs. Um, uh, it's very important to notice uh, certain details. Um, as, as I was alluding to earlier, the building sits on a, on a sloping lot and for office purposes, uh, this has been uh, um, mitigated by stairs. Um, and you could see from the, on, on the upper picture um, towards the center, uh, approximately from the bottom of the stairs to the uh, uh, um, top of the stairs, it's approximately six to eight feet um, uh, tall. <clears throat> and this, this impacts uh, utility of the property and or what we consider is necessary for, for the building to, um, to optimally function. Uh, further, on the bottom page of page 12, there is a, um, a retaining wall that supports uh, earth from um, sliding down. And that is approximately another uh, six feet in, in height uh, below, uh, below the stairs. On page 13, uh, this is uh, looking north from the upper parking, looking towards the canopy that was built. And uh, you could see that from the upper parking lot towards the canopy, you can't drive straight down without uh, substantial earth, earthwork. Uh, there's a, um, and I'll, I'll show that on an, in another picture, but there's a, approximately five to six feet of, of height difference uh, between um, the, park, the upper or the southern parking lot and where the building sits. Uh, page 13, uh, this is a picture from the freeway, uh, 118, looking uh, east, and uh, you, you could basically see how how much higher the property sits. You could barely see the building uh, towards the right um, third of the of the picture. There's a little bit of a uh, of this canopy that can be seen, and that's <coughs> uh, approximately 80 to 100 feet above uh, freeway level. <coughs> um, Again, page 14, uh, for the same purposes, illustrating a retaining wall uh, to the access road. 
And then uh, on the bottom, uh, it, it shows uh, um, the change in elevation on the left-hand side, where the parking uh, light, uh, uh, parking upper southernmost parking lot is located versus where the property sits. <clears throat> uh, similar case uh, is with uh, the parking garage uh, on page 15. Uh, you can see the, the three-story plus ground floor uh, uh, parking structure on the upper photograph. And um, again, it sits on a slope and, and uh, there's only one uh, access to the west portion of the, of the parking. Uh, again, due to the sloping nature of, of the lot. And then this is further uh, is illustrated uh, on the east side of the subject lot and uh, from the east looking west um, where the, um, uh, this is looking from the office building that's adjacent to the uh, east with the, um, pedestrian uh, bridge. And you can see that um, <clears throat> there's substantial elevation um, difference. <clears throat> On page 16, uh, this is a view of, um, of the uh, northern uh, parking lot that has an access road um, and again, on the right-hand side, you could see a substantial, approximately six feet, uh, six foot, um, at, and it varies uh, depending on where you stand, uh, but approximately six foot uh, retaining wall, uh, which prevents the utility of the site um, uh, with, with this uh, requirement. Excuse me, I didn't catch it. Prevents the what of the site? Utility. Thank you. <clears throat> On page 17, uh, this is an interior view of the ground floor area. Uh, this is where uh, subject, uh, this is currently where we utilize uh, the, the building. Uh, the upper picture shows uh, warehouse uh, storage area. That's, that's where packages are stored and, and sorted. Um, on page on the bottom page of 17, um, I took this picture specifically to illustrate that uh, there are uh, cross beams uh, uh, that that prevent uh, uh, again utility of the uh, of the building uh, or free flow of goods, and you could see those kind of um, <clears throat> at 45 degree or not even 45 degree, let, maybe 30 degree, uh, supporting beams of the upper level or second floor. Uh, and they're throughout the building, which, is, which also limits utility of the space. Uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, furthermore, the clear height uh, uh, for the ground floor is approximately uh, 12 to 13 feet and then um, in certain cases, uh, due to limitation and and uh, uh, restrictive nature of the of the beams, it is uh, it is closer to ten foot clear height. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, uh, office uh, space, and that could be seen uh, seen on page 18. Most of our uh, uh, employees are out there in the warehouse space, but there's uh, the upper level, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, uh, the office portion is used for uh, a little bit of um, administrative uh, purposes, but also for uh, rest and, and leisure. And you can see that with the ping pong table. Same thing on, page, on the bottom page of 18, that's a lunch uh, break room. Um, also been converted from, from office space to, to a break room. <clears throat> On page 20, 
Uh, this is uh, an illustration of what the upper level or office areas uh, look like. Uh, essentially, everything has been uh, disabled. Uh, all the electricity, all the HVAC systems are non-functioning. Uh, uh, we don't actively use the space. Uh, it has been uh, closed off. And uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, we don't have permits to use the space. Um, furthermore, to on page 21, uh, the upper uh, photograph again shows a uh, hallway with uh, HVAC um, uh, tubes uh, cut off. Uh, there's wires hanging all over the place. Um, <clears throat> on page 22, more of the same. Um, and page 23. Uh, I've uh, really made it into a point to show that the upper level is, for lack of a better word, uh, non-functional at this point and would require substantial investment to either retrofit or to, uh, of course, the other alternative option is to increase uh, ground floor uh, clearance from 12 feet to, to 24 feet. And, of course, that... <laughs> that would also require an investment. Um, we, uh, again, for, uh, as I was uh, stating earlier, because uh, when we um, um, when we need a new facility uh, to operate, we fast track uh, anything and everything that's related to the business for our purposes. And if we're not going to use the upper uh, uh, level, and if we don't need the greater clear height, uh, we're not going to spend the money nor the time to uh, make it into a usable space. And, and that could be clearly seen in the pictures provided. Uh, on page 24, this is actually uh, an estimated um, uh, usable area of the uh, subject property as provided by the assessor's office. And so the assessor's office has um, uh, used software to, to calculate the square footage of usable sp space. Um, the subject lot is um, 43 acres or 1.8 million, almost 1.9 million square feet. The usable area or space that's not either sloping or uh, uh, hard to get to or whatnot is approximately half of that uh, or 948,000 square feet according to the assessor's office. Uh, this will be important down the road in order to estimate whether there is surplus land or excess land or, or what other value that we could add uh, in addition to the value that's generated by the underlying improvements. Uh, on page 25, I apologize that you can't see it very well. <clears throat> um, uh, but um, I, I think the assessor, with all due respect, the assessor's office was very ambitious in estimating the usable area for a couple of reasons. Um, a, if you could see on the bottom, um, there's a little round um, uh, structure, and, and that is a water tank. And uh, the way the assessor calculated usable square footage is including that uh, access road. Well, uh, we have to maintain, there's this one uh, water tank and there's another one further up the hill. Uh, we need to maintain and provide access uh, free and clear, unobstructed, to the utility companies that, that maintain those structures. And, and so by, um, by including the road access along the 
uh, left or western uh, portion of this um, um, of this image, it is uh, essentially um, uh, that that would allow us to obstruct um, access to to the water tanks, and we can't do that. And so, in order um, uh, for the utility companies to have access to the water tank. Um, we need to keep the road uh, uh, clear, and as such, we can't. Uh, the only way that we can use it is by driving on it as well. We can't use it for storage or other alternative uses. <coughs> um, <clears throat> additionally, I've uh, um, uh, with dashed lines, it's kind of squiggly dashed lines, uh, shown. Um, uh, uh, extreme topography that that is uh, added that, by the assessor as usable area, and uh, by mere fact of steep slopes, uh, it is not usable. Um, and so I think when when we look when we look at other industrial properties, a lot of them sit on fairly flat lots, and every portion of the of the lot. Is, is has the same utility. In, in our case, um, we don't. And so it, it, ha it prov gives an appearance of greater um, uh, utility, but it's, it's glorified um, <coughs> um, guarding space. Um. <clears throat> And so uh, I go through the calculation of approximately 10% um, uh, uh, of that sloping area is, is deducted, which le leaves us at um, 900,600 square feet of, of usable land, less the building is 290,000 square feet times 2.5 land to building ratio, which is fairly typical uh, for, for industrial properties. That Excuse me, the acronym LTB, could you tell me what that stands for? LTB, Land to Building Ratio. Thank you. Uh, in other words, there's two and a half times more land that's needed to support the, the size of the building. <clears throat> and that's 725,000 square feet, which leaves us with excess land of approximately 175,000 square feet, more or less. <clears throat> but I think in the big picture, uh, this is not a um, that important value indicator, indicator, but we want to account for it. Uh, also, uh, on page 25, on kind of the, uh, the north end, there is a uh, approximately 100 foot by 409 foot um, uh, also uh, so-called buildable area or usable area. It's, it's a flat area uh, that the assessor uh, determined as, as functional. Uh, it's on page 26. The upper photograph is uh, illustrating that, that area. Um, I frankly don't know how, how maybe it could be used for parking. Uh, I don't know if it could be used for uh, uh, building of another uh, uh, structure. Uh, but uh, considering that the subject property was built in uh, 1984, and since 1984, uh, that piece of land has not been developed <clears throat> is an indicator of either uh, inability to develop it or uh, the development is not financially feasible. Um, on page 27, uh, again, this is to further illustrate uh, the sloping nature of the lot and 
um, either uh, substantial investment would need to be made in order to retrofit the, the, whole, the whole lot's utility, or we need to uh, uh, discount uh, that land, that sloping land, as not usable for any practical purposes. All right. <clears throat> so that kind of gives you an overview of the property. Uh, the next, on page 28 and several pages down, this is to uh, focus on and support the cost approach. These are uh, land sales. Uh, where you see on the map um, where the uh, Madeira Road and Highway 18 cross, to the right of, uh, of that is where the subject property is located. So these land sales are in very, very close proximity uh, to the subject property. <clears throat> and so uh, sale number one sold for, um, and you could, you could see that on, on, the, on the page under the section transaction details on the left-hand side, um, it sold for $3 million or approximately, uh, and I'll just round, $13 a square foot in 2019. Uh, the next lot sold for $15 a square foot. That's comparable number two. Uh, comparable number three sold for 528 a square foot. Uh, there was an assemblage of two lots, so uh, three and four are um, two lots that are adjacent. And by combining the two lots at 528 a square foot and the next one of 885 a square foot, uh, the individual was able to um, uh, erect a larger structure on both lots. So they, they've assembled two lots together. On page 37, uh, sale number five, uh, great sale, sold right before the date of value. Um, it's industrial land, uh, sold for $11 billion, $11 million or 1942 a square foot. Sale number six, uh, similarly, sold for uh, 1986 a square foot. <clears throat> and looking at, at all these sales, including the subject properties sale of $16 million, which essentially sold for land value as a redevelopment project, uh, it is reasonable to conclude land value for the usable area of the subject lot of $20 a square foot. And that's what we use as, as base land value for the cost approach. Uh, on page 41, on page 41, so the next several pages, these are um, printouts of Marshall and Swift cost approach manual. And it, uh, uh, it illustrates uh, by definition what, what our property is, which is industrial warehouse on page 41. Um, uh, the base cost for the building is $53.50 a square foot for class C average concrete tilt-up construction. Um, uh, then we also added uh, parking structure on page 43 at $56 a square foot. Uh, Uh, the interior office space, so the upper portion or second level of the subject property is added at 56.50 a square foot before adjustments. And then for uh, additional items such as uh, cooling, uh, so the base cost includes heating, we need to add for cooling at 575 a square foot. Uh, we've also added uh, uh, sp sprinklers at a buck ninety-four a square foot, and and um, <clears throat> and the canopy that's uh, kind of towards 
as you've seen illustrated towards the more often it's on the left hand side of the image at 4125 square foot. Uh, several adjustments are made for floor area perimeter. Uh, on page 48, this is an adjustment for height, building height. So the subject is 24 foot building. Uh, yard improvements, so this, this would be for asphalt and, and concrete. And page 50 shows a typical life of, of, a, of a building. <clears throat> um, the subject property is actually, um, it was built in 1984. And so as such, uh, the property is 37 years old. So it was um, uh, very close to being at the end of its useful life. And we could see that uh, de facto by the fact that it originally sold for essentially land value. Um, and this, this table uh, illustrates that a typical life is 45 years, years old. And I, I think... Um, Well, I don't think I know this for a fact. Uh, um, a lot of uh, older properties go through what's known as interim value, meaning they teeter or they, they, they are on the edge of whether to extend that life by remodeling or improving the property, or uh, if the economics are right, to demolish and build something new. And it's, that's known as interim value. And that's where the, the, um, the subject property uh, in the life spectrum of, of, of the cycle uh, is located. <clears throat> and then uh, page, ugh, page 50, I can't even read this. 51 and 52, uh, these are current and local multipliers, so adjustments to the cost manual for time and for uh, locational differences. So Ventura County is 19% uh, more expensive uh, uh, cost of construction. And so we get to the summary of the cost approach on page 53. So everything that I went through uh, from the cost manual is summarized here on this single page. Uh, and so, again, distribution warehouse, <clears throat> class C uh, quality, concrete tilt-up building, um, base cost is $51 a square foot. We adjust it for a height of 24 feet. And then we adjust for a per perimeter of the building. Uh, which is 0.87 uh, adjustment factor, uh, gives us an adjusted cost index of 1.07, which we also adjust for the current and local multipliers. So for time and for location. And um, as such, uh, the overall adjustment is 1.49 which we apply to $51 base cost. That gives us an adjusted base rate of 81.25 per square foot. We apply the $81 to the base building area or the building footprint. And that gives us base building cost of 11.9, almost $12 million. Um, <clears throat> In addition to that, we apply the factors of cooling and sprinklers. Um, and, then, um, and then we depreciate it based on, on, the, on, the mo on, on the fact that most of the life has passed for this building. Um, similarly, uh, we also add for um, uh, for asphalt parking, um, 
for concrete, concrete is where the trucks um, park. Uh, for the canopy, and so if you notice here, the effective age of canopy is one year because it's basically brand new. And similarly, on the right-hand side, the depreciation associated with that is, is very minimal. Um, the parking structure that's, that's um, uh, utilized by the adjacent property is added at depreciated cost of eight and a half million. And then we also add uh, the cost of interior space. The second level, 142,000 square foot office space at 56.50 a square foot. Uh, frankly, I, I think this is generous considering what condition uh, the space is located, but um, for the purposes of cost approach, it's added at, at 9 million. And as such, 22 million for the extra cost and the total cost of improvements of 41 million. And we also add 10% um, for entrepreneurial incentive, assuming uh, the building is spec built. And then we add the depreciated cost to the underlying land value, which, which is what I was referring to earlier. 948,000 square feet, according to the assessor, is usable land at $20 a square foot, according to the sales, gives us indicated value of land of $18.9 million, which is very similar to what the subject property sold for essentially land value just a year earlier at 16 million. Um, and then we give a little bit of value or a buck a square foot for the undevelopable um, hillside which basically serves as buffer, um, and that's that's another uh, million dollars essentially. So approximately 19.9 million plus the depreciated cost of uh, uh, improvements gives us an indicated value by the cost approach of 65 million, or approximately 224 dollars based on 290 thousand square foot property. <clears throat> the next uh, approach to value is income approach. Uh, on page 54, uh, we've looked at uh, seven uh, uh, properties that have um, in, in, in the near faci facility that, that had uh, um, asking rent, inc including the subject property, which is in, in this case on page 55 is shown as number five. And uh, rentals one, two, three, four, and six all come in at approximately $9 per square foot. The only two properties with higher rents are number five, which is the subject property, and number seven, which is also an Amazon building. And the only reason that those two properties came in at a higher rent is because of this, what, what I alluded to earlier, the extra uh, premium that we pay to adjust the properties uh, specific to our needs and use. And then that cost of construction is then added on to the to the uh, market rent, uh, and we back essentially we back into a lease rate. So uh, both number five and number seven are above market rental rates. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to dive too deep into each individual rental property. However, remember the subject property's ground floor is approximately 12 foot clear. Excuse me. Yes. Did you say I thought you said number five was, was the subject property. Is, is that page 58 you're talking about? Uh, page 55. Oh, page 55, okay. Yeah. You said, and, and, I thought you said uh, sale five, okay. Uh, I'm sorry, it's rental, <laughs> lease, lease comp. 
Okay, number page five, and it's chronological, top to bottom, one through seven. So we're talking about five and seven, and you could visually see that uh, one, two, three, four are oh, in the okay. Right I was looking. Range. I was looking at your Detail. page, page five of the of the with the pictures on them. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you're oh. talking. You're talking about page fifty six then. Uh, so now I'm, I'm on page 56. Okay, so you're and, to, okay, I'm sorry. Page 56 and so on, several pages. These provide additional details on the rentals uh, against which the subject property competes. And again, as I've mentioned earlier, the subject property's clear height is approximately 12 feet. In some spots, it's, it's even less than that. So this rental number number one on page 56, 136,000 square foot building built in 1988, similar to the subject properties built age of 1984, has a rental rate of 780 on triple net basis and the ceiling height of 30 feet. There's a big difference between 12 and 30 feet, and the rental rate is at 780. Similarly, 939 a square foot on page 57, 202,000 square foot building. Uh, this property was also built in 1988. It has a 24 foot clear, which is potentially something that the subject property may have, uh, but doesn't have currently due to the upper level um, office area. Rental number three on page 58. Again, towards the bottom of the page, this is a newer building uh, built in 1994, 255,000 square foot building, 30 foot clear, $9 a square foot. Rental number four, 888. Again, 26 foot clear, built in 1993. And here's the subject property. 1476 a square foot for a 13 foot clear building with a currently unusable upper level storage. And it says that the building is built in 2021. That is erroneous. That is incorrect. The building is the same. It was built in 1984, uh, uh, but it was remodeled in uh, by essentially clearing of the office area on the ground floor. Uh, again, 13 foot clear, it says here. Uh, my measurements indicated 12 foot clear. Either way, it's a sizable difference. Um, <clears throat> Page 61, this is rental number six, nine foot triple net, built in 1968, older building, 20 foot clear, $9 a square foot. And rental number seven, which is also occupied by Amazon, ceiling heights for this building is 38 and a half feet, built in 1975, with a rental rate of 1140. Uh, a square foot. And again, from, from my experience, this rental rate is also above market because when we go into, uh, when we go into a, f a facility, we retrofit it to our use and that costs money. And that's, that money is not uh, uh, fronted to us without a return. So that extra cost of retrofitting is added on uh, to the lease rate. And that's, that's why uh, our leases are, are, are higher than, uh, lease rates are higher than typical. Um, the next several pages are uh, sources for cap rates. Uh, these are just studies. So for LA warehouse, approximately uh, six and a half uh, percent cap rate, uh, uh, realty rates, uh, Couple of sources for um, for LA County, eight and a, and a 
uh, in the quarter for um, on page 65, <clears throat> seven and a half um, um, cap rate uh, surveyed uh, surveyed rates of 4.75. Um, <clears throat> but uh, most of the sources for cap rates is is from the sales, which we'll look at them shortly. Uh, on page 67, uh, this is a summary uh, of what we just looked at uh, <clears throat> with a number of sources for capitalization rate, for, for vacancy rates, um, uh, for rental comps. Uh, you can see lines uh, 8 through 13, which is 14, which is what we just went through. And down on the bottom, on page 67, uh, this, uh, these are the chosen or selected uh, capitalization, uh, vacancy, and rental parameters. And so for the purposes of uh, valuing the subject property, we estimate that the rent is $10 a square foot. So even greater than, than what most of the comps are saying. Uh, vacancy rate at 3%, that's uh, very minimal. And then a capitalization rate of four and a quarter uh, rate. And these parameters are then summarized in an income approach on page 68. So we take $10 a square foot times 290,000 square foot building. We get 2.9 million poten uh, PGI, potential gross income. Uh, we make an adjustment for market vacancy of 3%. Uh, we are not even adjusting for uh, credit loss. Uh, we are making minor adjustment uh, under, on the expense for uh, managing the asset of 2%, and then replacement reserves at 29 cents a square foot or another 3%. Overall, a 5% uh, expense ratio, which is also very generous. As such, the NOI, net operating income, comes in at 2.6 million, 74,337, capitalized at 4.25%, gives us an indicated value attributable to the economic unit of $62.9 million. To that, we also add uh, uh, excess land associated with the subject property of approximately 175,000 square feet at $20 a square foot, which is $3.5 million. And as such, the indicated total value for the subject property by income approach is $66.4 million or $229 a square foot. <clears throat> uh, the next and last approach to value is market approach or comparable sales approach. On page 69, uh, this is showing where um, where comparable sales are located. But before we go dive into that, I'd like to show an interesting parallel uh, between comparable sales number four and five on page 69. Four and five is a sale of the same property approximately one year apart. It sold for 32 million or $105 a square foot. And then Amazon signed the lease and the property a year later sells for $209 a square foot. On page uh, comp number six and seven, similar deal. <clears throat> property sells for $130 a square foot. Amazon signs a lease. A year later, the property sells for $209 a square foot. The subject property sells for $16 million. A year later, it sells for $441 a square foot. I uh, chuckle 
and I hear the increase. So clearly, it's not the value of real estate that went up. It's real estate and something else. And that's the intangible value of the least fee interest. <clears throat> I'll go through uh, these sales uh, on the, I suppose, on, on a case by case basis. Um, <clears throat> On page 71, comp number one, located at 450 American Street in Simi Valley, which is right adjacent to the subject property. It's an office building. This property sold less than a year before the subject property sells. It sells for $143 a square foot. The subject property that's adjacent to it sells for $440 a square foot. At one point, these were essentially the same buildings. And so intuition would tell me that, hey, we could all make a lot of money by purchasing this property for $143 a square foot and gutting it and making it into a a warehouse and, and, so, and, and flipping it for $440 a square foot, right? Not quiet. A very particular tenant is, is necessary in order for that to happen. Uh, additional cost is necessary for that uh, to occur. By the way, this, this uh, adjacent building uh, is the property that's utilizing the multi-story parking garage uh, next to the, on, on the subject property lot. All right, well, <clears throat> here's an industrial building on page 73, 6,000 Condor Drive, sold for $236 a square foot. Um, built in 1988, same year as the subject property, 203,000 square feet, sold just two months after the subject data value, 12, 15, 20, 21. <clears throat> the next uh, facility on page 76 in Camarillo, uh, to, 201 Flynn Road, uh, this property sold for um, $170 a square foot. It's an industrial building, no different than the subject property. This one sold for 5.4 cap rate, <coughs> albeit not, sounds like it wasn't as, as a quality tenant as, a, as Amazon because cap rate is at 5.4%. Uh, the next <clears throat> several sales, I'm not going to uh, dive into <clears throat> each one of them, but these are the ones that are sold and resold and are occupied by Amazon, sale number four and five. Um, again, but even as or even with Amazon occupancy, uh, the property sold for $209 a square foot as an industrial building. Page number 85, sale number six and seven. It's the same property, sold and resold, <coughs> and with Amazon as a tenant, uh, the property sold for $209 a square foot as well. <coughs> Industrial building with 35 foot clear heights. Greater clear heights means greater storage capacity. Here's the subject property, again. Um, <clears throat> built in 1984 on page 91. Um, interestingly enough, on page 92, so, so the subject property 
sells for $128 million. In the comment section, under transaction notes on page 92, and I'll read it verbatim. Sale price was confirmed by the buyer. Sale price is combined, uh, comprised of the hub as an industrial building totaling 290,000 square feet. Sale price reported $128 a square foot. $128 million for $141 a square foot. Next sentence, sale was an off-market transaction. The property was never advertised. It was never exposed to the market. The mere definition of an arm's length transaction requires for the property to be exposed to market participants. Uh, then it says subject property was fully leased to Amazon on triple net basis through 2036 with 2% annual escalations. First year performer rate indicates <coughs> reported cap rate of 3.35%. Amazon extensively renovated the property over the past year, transforming the former corporate office of Bank of America to serve as an e-commerce giant. Well, that's maybe an overstatement, but the renovations, including added significant loading and van staging areas, as well as other charges. Last sentence, the motivation for the buyer was their up leg in the 1031 exchange. The assessor requested that I dive deeper into this and we uh, reached out to the <coughs> landlord to, to get further details on how, how what was the uh, motivations for purchasing the property at this, at this rate? This is what the landlord told us. Uh, they've sold the property that they've owned for many, many years. Uh, I believe it was Orange County, anyways, uh, further away. And, and they, they were facing a substantial capital gains tax. So they, they had a property in mind in order to uh, roll over their capital gains. However, that sale, the purchase did not work out. As a result, they started anxiously hunting uh, brokers for an investment that would fit their criteria for an up leg in the 1031 exchange so they would avoid this huge uh, tax bill. They found this property, property that was never exposed to the market, and they've committed to it, and they, they've made, um, <clears throat> they, they made the transaction work. Uh, in my mind, that's being under duress, under duress by the taxing authority. They were facing several hundred million, I'm sorry, so, several dozen million dollar tax bill. And so they, they got into this property so that they would, would be able to push or, or delay paying of capital gains tax on their prior sale. <clears throat> I'll proceed further. Page 96. Can, can, a, yeah, I know no, this is not really the time, but before we skip this, can you can you go back to your last two statements and uh, yes, sir. and explain your position a little better? Because on one hand you said this was an off-market sale. Yes. Wasn't on the market, wasn't exposed to market. Then you say they had this property and so they went and they started looking through their, contacting their brokers. Uh, well, let me rephrase that. <clears throat> uh, the property was off market, so it was never exposed to the market. A different a property, the buyer, sold an existing property and they had an engagement, an arrangement, I should say, to transfer their capital gains in the 1031 from the sold property to another property. That sale never happened. Right. So the buyer started looking for brokers who could fit their investment criteria with the purchase. And this was the property that they were able to, to find. So they, 
you get on the phone and you start dialing for dollars, right? And this property was being prepped to go to market, but it was never exposed to market, if that makes sense. No further questions at this time. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> um, page 96. Uh, comp number 10. Uh, this is an Amazon facility that also sold for $333 a square foot, uh, approximately six months before the sale of the subject. Uh, built in 1975 with a 38-foot clear, 38 and a half foot clear, and this property also undergone some extensive renovations in order to, uh, for, for the building to work uh, for our purposes, for our uh, <coughs> logistical requirements. Page 99, 609 Science Drive in Moore Park. Uh, <clears throat> 1988 built. 135,000 square foot building, sold for 16 and a half million for $122 a square foot. Um, page 101, uh, 1757. So this, this is also, I, I believe, I believe this is an Amazon building as well, but uh, $245 a square foot. Um, uh, this is a, essentially a brand new building built in 2020 for uh, with 211,000 square feet. This property sells or recapitalized at $245 a square foot. Uh, page 103, 1800 Tapo Canyon, Canyon Road. Uh, this is this is one of those properties that's similar to a subject property that was teetering on the edge of either redevelopment or additional cash infusion to retrofit it. At age of 39, subject properties age is 38 years old. Uh, ultimately, this property was dem demolished, but this this facility sold for $89 a square foot and essentially land value. At uh, at the time, uh, it was it was questionable whether the building would be retained or not. Uh, ultimately, the buyer chose to to demolish the the, the building. <clears throat> and lastly, uh, number fourteen, a sale of uh, two hundred and forty two thousand square foot building. Built in 1995, $46.4 million, $191 a square foot. And this facility had 26 foot clear uh, height. And again, <laughs> I can't reiterate it enough, but uh, greater the height, greater storage capacity. And, and industrial uh, properties are valued uh, in addition to, and among other things, the ability to store higher. <clears throat> On page 108, I've uh, put together all of these uh, uh, sales um, um, that we just went through in the chart. I've made several adjustments for time and date and condition. Um, including sale number eight and nine, which is the subject <coughs> property. Subject property is not included in the uh, estimating of, of value, but it's, it, it also illustrates how, uh, how extreme the sale of the subject property is relative to the rest of the market, which again indicates an intangible value of a least fee interest in the real estate. <coughs> And uh, for the sake of time, I'm, I'm not gonna go through each individual adjustment, but after making the adjustments for the differences, uh, approximately uh, typical adjusted um, 
<coughs> typical adjusted um, price is hundred and I'm sorry, $206 a square foot times 290,000 square foot building. <coughs> Plus, we, we add for the potential, even though we're making an adjustment already for the land to building ratio in, in, in the sales. But just to be on the safe side, we're also adding excess land at three and a half million, which we calculated earlier, which gives us an indicated value for the subject property of $63.3 million, or so $218 a square foot. Uh, page 109, uh, additional uh, uh, support for the, for the cap rate. <clears throat> Last thing I want to talk about is the parking structure. So the parking structure is least the three-story plus ground floor structure is leased for $1 to the property adjacent, which is the office building. We don't have control, control of it. Um, this is a second amendment um, <coughs> associated with that, with that structure. And on page on page 110, that shows that what it is and where it is, and etc. cetera. Uh, on page 111, section three, subsection 3.1, 3.11, it says grant of parking and access easement. A perpetual exclusive easement to access park vehicles, and otherwise utilize, maintain above ground parking structure. Perpetual easement. So property rights just went from the subject property to an adjacent building with a perpetual easement. <clears throat> we don't have control of the, of the parking structure. And section 3.1.2, a perpetual exclusive easement parked no less than 132 passenger vehicles and otherwise parking related purposes, et cetera. I'll skip all the exciting language <clears throat> um, to page, and this, is, this has been recorded, notarized, and et cetera. Uh, for your visual appreciation, on page 128, this is exhibit C, depiction of Grand Tour property parking structure. In hard, <clears throat> in hard, hard uh, black uh, dark line uh, is outlined the four story or three plus ground floor parking structure. In addition to that, there's two dashed lines that are to the left of that parking structure which is additional parking <coughs> provided by this easement to the adjacent parking, to, to the adjacent uh, uh, property, which frankly needs the parking because they operate uh, an office building and their occupancy is, is greater. Office buildings have greater occupancy on per square foot basis than industrial properties. Um, and so the, uh, the utility or the use of the subject lot is greatly diminished by this easement, perpetual is easement, and by the access road <coughs> to the water tanks that are on the, uh, I guess on the south or, or on the left hand side if you're looking at, a, at an image. Uh, along the southern boundary of the property. As such, and I'm looking right now on page 133, this is a summary of what we reviewed today. The 1984 built 290,000 square foot property with 
warehouse space on the ground floor of 147,000 square feet, an office portion of 142,000 square foot that is currently in unusable condition. As shown by the cost approach, indicates a value of $65 million, $224 a square foot. Sales or market approach indicates a value of $63 million. Income approach indicates a value of $66 million. For the benefit of doubt, we reconcile everything at $66 million or $227 a square foot. And, and we request the board to, to recognize that there's value, <coughs> value in use that's different than value in exchange. An investment value attributable, attributable to the lease is something greater than the value of real estate alone. And this is not just shown by the subject property. It's clearly illustrated by a number of sales where Amazon is, <coughs> is a tenant. There's, there's value in having a long-term lease in place where your cost of constructions are reimbursed for, um, I forget, 15 years, 20, 38, uh, for, a number, for, for a long duration. So a property that was ready to be demolished, we gave an infusion, an additional life, because it, there's a value to the individual user, Amazon, but the market, based on other uh, comparable sales, based on rental information, does not value it the same. And that's, that's, that's the answer we need to, uh, to reflect today. What is the market value of real estate, not the intangible value associated with the lease? Are there any questions? Okay, we'll get to that. Um, thank you very much. Right now is a chance for the, op the assessor's office to ask questions of your presentation. Okay. Could we possibly take at least a short break? Yeah, we can. Okay. Would your board we like possibly to lunch take a long break? <laughs> I know. Do we want to do lunch and then have you ask questions and then have him can you present or is... Can I get together with the board for just a second? Yeah. I mean, just a okay. circle here. Uh, I believe our questions will be extensive, uh, at least probably an hour.
<laughs> okay. We feel it's best if we take a lunch break right now. And then if you guys want to prepare your questions on your lunch break, that's okay. And then when we come back from lunch break, the assessor's office will ask questions of your presentation. And then the, uh, the board will have a chance to ask questions of your presentation. And then it's a chance for them to present their case. And then it switches. And then we all ask questions of them. So what time do we want to come back? Do we need until... Is 1.15 okay, or do you want until 1.30? It's got to be 1.30, because I've got to walk home. Today. I've got to walk, okay. Okay, then we're adjourned until 1.30.
All right, good afternoon, it's 1.30, court is back in session, and I believe we are about to hear the assessor's office questions of the applicant's presentation. Sorry, uh, Joe Phillips with the assessor's office. I'll start off the questions real quick. Uh, well, first of all, I just wanted to thank the board for the lunch break. Uh, there was a significant amount of brand new information contained in here that we hadn't seen before. Uh, so it did require just a little bit more research. Um, the first question I want to ask uh, was, you are employed by Amazon, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, and on the first page of your presentation, it says presented by uh, James Polanyanski. Uh, so you're the presenter today. Are you also the appraiser that performed the appraisal? Uh, I put the information together, yes. You put it together, so, you, okay, so you did the appraisal, okay. Um, and are you a licensed appraiser? Uh, I'm licensed, I'm a licensed appraiser in the state of Washington and Oregon. Okay, but not, not California. in California? No. Okay. Uh, can you explain your qualifications that would allow you to perform appraisals in California? Well, first of all, I did not perform an appraisal. I performed an evaluation of the subject property for property tax purposes. Um, I worked as an appraiser for uh, 10 years uh, for a regional firm in Washington State uh, that uh, included uh, appraisals for um, uh, underwriting purposes, for right-of-way, for uh, estate, for litigation uh, that ranged from <clears throat> uh, office, retail, industrial, multifamily special purpose properties, um, et cetera. Okay, you said this isn't an appraisal, it's evaluation, what's the difference? Um, the primary difference is uh, uh, an, appraisal, an appraisal has to be uh, USPAP compliant. So this is not USPAP compliant? Uh, I, <clears throat> I would need to go through every element of a USPAP uh, compliance process uh, from the top of my head. I, I don't believe so. So your license in Washington and Oregon would require you to be USPAP compliant, but no license in California requires you to be USPAP compliant? So you set it, do you set aside USPAP when performing appraisals in California? Um, you may not have heard me earlier. I said I did not perform an appraisal. You didn't perform this appraisal? I didn't perform an appraisal. I performed an evaluation. Okay. Uh, so based on your presentation today, uh, Cancilla Properties 2 LLC purchased the property on October 1st, 2021. Is that correct? I believe so. Okay. And um, they purchased it for $128 million. Uh, based on your tev testimony and evidence today, you're suggesting the actual value was $66 million. Uh, so this, uh, <clears throat> this owner, which is an investment owner, they made a very uh, pretty poor and uninformed decision buying it double the actual market value? No. No? Then no. why did they purchase it for almost double the market value? Different motivations. So what, can you expound on that? Uh, uh, there are different types of values out there in the real world. <clears throat> For the purposes of property tax, we, we focus on a specific type of property value, which is fair market value and the definition that the state has 
for that. <clears throat> there's, uh, there's liquidation value, there's investment value, there's a plethora of other values that may uh, be, um, uh, may be impacting investor decisions. So besides the real estate value, what other value did they gain when they purchased this property? Uh, well, I would have to speculate, but um, <clears throat> uh, it is my understanding that the uh, two factors affecting their, the value that they've acquired was um, uh, obviously real estate, which is based on um, market evidence suggested by <clears throat> the evidence presented before the board. Uh, second is uh, the value associated with lease, uh, which is lease fee value. Uh, part of it is uh, cost reimbursement uh, uh, of the expenses incurred converting the property. Part of it is the uh, uh, duration <coughs> and durability of uh, tier one tenant. Uh, the other value uh, that, that the investor uh, acquired by completing this, this, this deal is um, uh, not having to pay uh, capital gains tax from their previous um, uh, investment. Okay. I think we're going to tackle a few more of those questions a little bit, but I'll move on. Um, I want to go to page 25 of your exhibit. Okay. So that 2.5 land to building ratio, uh, where's that coming from? Well, uh, really, it's it's coming from uh, my personal experience uh, seeing industrial properties in the market. But also, uh, if we look, and if I may uh, direct your attention to page Page 108, um, these are comparable sales uh, that were used. And <clears throat> you could see kind of halfway uh, down the middle of this chart uh, what other properties, what their lend to building ratios are. Um, and they, they range from as low as uh, just over two to as high as um, uh, north of three. <clears throat> uh, but a typical ratio is, um, uh, again, from my experience, is to, to about, about two and a half. Um, <clears throat> I think what, what recently we're, um, we're seeing is that ratio has been uh, going up. Um, but a lot of it also depends on the use of the property as well. All right, next question is gonna be on page 28. Um, so these are your land sales that you're relying on to determine a land value for the cost approach, correct? That's right. Were any of these supplied to the assessor prior to today? Uh, I don't know. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> so I, I, I caught this, uh, valuation midpoint, uh, my Primer, uh, pre, uh, my coworker um, uh, retired, and she performed initial dilation, and I um, caught it halfway. So I don't know what was sent to the assessor's office or not, um, but I, I I did not send this to the assessor's office. So, were you the one that compiled this list? Uh, yes. So if you compiled the list and you didn't send it to us, so would the answer then be no, it wasn't sent to us? I, well, I don't know what uh, my former coworker would, would have sent. Well, if your former coworker didn't compile the list, how could they send this to us? Uh, 
I, like I said, I don't know what coworker uh, had or had not sent before. Okay. Um, so the other thing with this is it doesn't look like you did any sort of adjustment grid to these land sales of any kind, no adjustments for differences in size, location, proximity to the freeway, anything? Uh, Topography. Uh, I have not made an adjustment grid for this. Um, they're all really similar to, to the subject in very close proximity. So uh, comps one through four, they sold all in 2019 prior to COVID, is that correct? Uh, that's what it says, yeah. So did uh, COVID have a positive, negative, any kind of effect on distribution centers or industrial properties in any way? Uh, I don't know. G generally speaking, I mean, it's, it's very uh, jurisdictional. Uh, generally speaking, um, uh, COVID did have a positive impact on, on certain types of facilities with certain types of use. Uh, so for example, uh, uh, for Amazon, which is part of the reason we uh, uh, expanded the network, um, that was that was a, uh, a, a major uh, boost to our to the business. Uh, as people stayed home, they ordered online more, and so we required more um, uh, uh, resources to to provide the, the service. Uh, a lot of other facilities didn't. Um, industrial facilities didn't, didn't experience the same boost. Um, um, I, manufacturing that, that utilizes industrial buildings, uh, R&D um, also util, utilize industrial buildings. That I haven't seen that um, that uh, that boost um, um, during COVID. Uh, also. <clears throat> Like I said, it's it's very jurisdictional, and so uh, for Amazon, where we had a significant presence, um, that um, that didn't result in in a boost in, in industrial properties, uh, in in locations where we uh, needed to have a, uh, a, a faster delivery times, then. Then yes, that like we we paid a significant premium to get into those properties. So let's maybe get a little more specific. If you were to compare comps one, two, three, and four to our subject property, a distribution center, mm -hmm. uh, should a time adjustment be warranted considering the effects COVID had? Uh, <clears throat> Certainly, but um, for one through four, uh, uh, there may need to be um, an adjustment made. My, my primary uh, weight was on, on the last two comps, uh, comp number uh, five and six. Uh, so both had uh, very... Um, uh, very similar size and utility, um, and both sold uh, around the same dollar per square foot basis. So, I don't, uh, frankly, I don't know if that's necessary. Uh, uh, there's not been enough sales to uh, to provide a paired sales uh, uh, adjustment. Um, but I mean, I, I see a point. Generally, they may need be a uh, an adjustment for time of some sort. It also, uh, uh, the adjustment for time is not uh, uniform or consistent. And so uh, prior to COVID, <clears throat> uh, uh, values were fairly flat. And only uh, at the beginning of COVID, actually towards the maybe end of uh, first quarter of COVID, that's when prices started to, to increase uh, substantially. So it's, it's not like prices were going up in a consistent manner. They were fairly flat, and then there was a spike towards the uh, beginning of COVID. 
Okay. Uh, taking a closer look at comp number five. Mm-hmm. Uh, you familiar with that comp? Uh, to the best of my abilities. So that comp, uh, the state that that land was in when it sold, can you describe that? Uh, can you elaborate on, on your question? Sorry, what was that? Can you elaborate on that question? I don't know what you're asking. Um, was it a flat graded lot, raw land, rolling hills, slopes, flat, you know, those types of, what are the descriptions of that property? Uh, to my knowledge, it, it was uh, raw land. Uh, uh, that's, that's the extent that I, I'm familiar. Okay, would it likely require lots of grading to be equivalent to the subject property? Uh, which part of the subject property? The usable part of the subject property. Uh, uh, grading is always required for, for development. Okay. I guess what I want to point out is comp number five is rolling hills ungraded, not level or flat or anything. It's just basic raw land, whereas, you know, comp number six appears to be graded, level, flat, somewhat ready to be built upon. So it seems there would be a significant difference in the amount of stages of production to bring comp number five up to a usable state. Uh, yeah, possibly. I mean, I, I think it depends on uh, what what it is you want to build, and um, and <clears throat> any type of grading. That's part of uh, uh, cost of construction. I mean, we're we're, we're evaluating evaluating or estimating value the raw land, not raw land with entitlements or grading completed, et cetera. And so if, I mean, if you're implying that uh, lot number six was uh, flat and didn't need additional grading, uh, well, comparing to the subject property, perhaps a downward adjustment to that price is needed. So final question on these. Um, are any of these land sales, were they purchased with the intention of building a distribution center? Uh, I, I don't know what the final intention is for <clears throat> for each individual investor. Um, I, I saw some of the comments here uh, hold for development um, down the road. In, in, investors uh, purchase land for a myriad of reasons. Ultimately, uh, it may be for uh, uh, for development, but not necessarily immediate development. Okay, I, right. I, I'm just asking if you knew, just because this is the first time we've seen them, so I wasn't able to do due diligence on each every single one here. Um, let's see. So moving on, I want to start getting into the cost approach. Uh, page fifty three. So my first question is going to reference page 42 and 53. On page 42, it shows you've selected um, class C average construction and you boxed 53.50 as the cost, according to Marshall and Swift. Uh, and yet on page 53, you're showing you chose 51 uh, which doesn't quite match. So uh, just curious why there's a difference there. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a mathematical error or input error. It should be 5350. Okay, thank you. Um, so that should be 5350. So my next question is going to be about depreciation. Um, so I didn't see the depreciation tables in your exhibit here. You got 
22.22%. Can and I'm just trying to figure out where that's coming from. Uh, that's based on the uh, useful life of the building and the effective age. Effective age of 10 years is it is uh, estimated after the re remodel. So I looked that up in Marshall and Swift, and it says it should be 8%. So I don't know. I'm just trying to figure out where the 22% is coming from. Uh, it's a, a straight line depreciation. Straight line depreciation. Yeah, one over the other. OK, so can you explain why you chose to use? You're using Marshall and Swift costs and then applying a straight line depreciation instead, in, instead of using Marshall and Swift depreciation. Can you explain why? For uh, expediency. Can you elaborate on that? I don't know what you mean. Uh, it's a straightforward way of looking at, at what, um, what remaining life uh, in, the, in the property is left, and then one divide over the other. Uh, generally, uh, especially on these older properties, um, uh, I feel that that's more representative. Uh, Marshall and Swift is, um, is, is pretty good at estimating depreciation um, uh, for newer properties. Um, Properties that have been remodeled, it's, it's much more challenging. Um, so a lot of the long-lived items in, in the property are, are still um, with the property, <clears throat> which is the walls, the roof, uh, the, the upper level. Um, and so 22% uh, seems more, more reasonable than, than the 8% associated with the 10-year with the ten, ten um, uh, uh, depreciation according to Mar Marshall and Swift. So, so you agree with Marshall and Swift costs when they determine those, but when Marshall and Swift determines depreciation, you feel you know better than them? Do you have, I mean, Marshall and Swift backs all of their information with market research according to their statements in their in their book, do you have anything to show that 22% is a better estimate? You have any market data to show 22% is have better? A, we have a great estimate uh, just a year ago when the property sold for land value. And so by infusing a little bit of money into the property, actually a lot of money, <clears throat> there's uh, uh, additional life given to the building. And so when... The, when Marshall and Swift looks at what at at, uh, at construction, right, they assume in that depreciation table there's no ongoing maintenance or remodel being made. The, this is not the case. The, the property essentially, based on the sale, it depreciated nearly 100 percent. And so, by infusing uh, additional uh, cash into the building. Um, the, the, the remaining life has been extended. So Mar Marshall and Swift may have the uh, great base costs. They, uh, the resulting depreciation, uh, I think, would be harder to, uh, to pinpoint. So I'm not quite sure you answered my question. So there's... It sounds like you don't have market evidence to support the 22% to overcome Marshall and Swift's 8%. Uh, again, a year ago, the property was 100% depreciated. It, the, sold, it sold for land value. The, there is no value in the building. So the building was to be torn down, completely unusable. 100% depreciation means 100% unusable. Uh, the, the term unusable is, is misleading. It was not uh, financially feasible to uh, uh, retain it in the condition that it was at the time of sale. Let's rephrase it a different way. Are there aspects of the original building that Amazon did not have to rebuild? 
Oh, yes. So there is usable. There is With remaining economic yes. life in that property prior to Amazon going in and making changes. And hence the, 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 hence the, va the, the concept of interim value. You just said is 100% depreciated, and yet Amazon did not have to tear it down and rebuild. So there is some econo economic life still left in that building. By infusing uh, uh, cost, re remodeled cost into it. OK. That kind of brings me to my next question. You're relying on Marshall and Swift and everything. Um, I'm curious. It wasn't in your presentation, but you mentioned a lot Amazon had to, you just said, pour a lot of money into the building. Substantial. What is that amount? I don't know. How come you don't know? I don't know. OK. Let me jump in there. Zachary Clifford with the assessor's office. Are you to tell me that you don't have access to the costs incurred by Amazon to build out that facility? Being as you're an employee of Amazon and representing them here at the hearing, uh, that's right. So, the uh, uh, de facto costs that were incurred were, were by the seller of the property. So, uh, when we uh, um, we don't actually do the work ourselves, right? So when we uh, uh, agree to lease a property we request the landlord to fit it to our specifications, right? And so the landlord estimates how much and what is needed in order to meet those specifications, and then they do it. Is that clearly stated in the Amazon lease? No, I don't know. You don't know? It doesn't know. need to be. It doesn't need to be? No. Okay. Because it is an important part. Are you telling me that when they drew up the lease, they had, they're taking it at the tenant's word, how much they put? Because I assume what they do is they say the base property leases for this much, and then because it cost us this much, uh, we're going to add that to your lease. They have no idea what that cost was. It could only have been ten thousand dollars, and they'll accept. Oh well, it cost it's us. Been, been, you must have some rough idea of, of how much it co they put into it. It's been more. It's been. I mean, it's been. It's it's likely uh, millions. Um, I, I don't know. So I think uh, you your own words were they put a lot into this. Yeah. So when you say a lot. Do you think it's two million, four million, forty million, eighty million? So unfortunately, I don't know. The the because of a sale, the prior uh, um, landlord had this information. I, I don't have access to it, so I can't speak to something that that I can't factually confirm. But it's, I mean, <clears throat> uh, to gut an entire first floor. That's an expensive endeavor. To add a 20, almost five, 24,000 square foot um, canopy, that's expensive. Um, it adds up. Just for clarification, so you, your li one of your statements you just made is that the owner did all of the remodel retrofitting to prepare the space for Amazon. Yes. So Amazon did not incur any of the costs, just the prior owner, developer, whatever you want to call them? That's your statement? Uh, not directly. Not directly. Can you yeah. explain that? Also, there, there's a cost reimbursement agreement where you, <clears throat> the developer um, um, may complete the work, and then we reimburse the developer for the cost. In this case, we agree on a certain rate and then the developer incurs the cost, we don't, it doesn't matter to what it costs, actual cost the developer to do it, as long as it, again, meets our specifications. Okay, so Amazon, Amazon didn't do any building in there. Okay, thank you. Um, my next question 
is maybe just a clerical one. Um, in your land valuation on page 53, it says commercial primary, $20 a square foot. Is that meant to be industrial, since this is an industrial property, or are you yeah, valuing that, it? That's for... meant to say commercially developable land, meaning usable land. OK, thank you. And then the next line, buffer undevelopable hillside land, a dollar per square foot. Yeah. Where's that coming from? It's a nominal value. I mean, I think generally, um, <clears throat> uh, property owners will will put a certain value to be a little bit, to have a little elbow room from their neighbors. Um, there's, you know, no one, no one uh, explicitly pays uh, a certain dollar amount for, for, for buffer land. But, you know, you have a little bit of privacy, it's worth something, and I, I nominally placed it as a, at a dollar to recognize it. Okay, but no market evidence to support that. All right, well, if we want to talk about market evidence, uh, market evidence is likely zero. Did, did you show any su support for that or in your presentation? No. Okay. Um, let's see. All right, I think that will conclude my questions. I'll turn it over to Zach here. If you wanna go ahead and uh, go to the income approach, I believe that is your page. Let's start at uh, 55. The lease comp one, 2900 North Madera Road. Does that have any industrial tenants or use? I mean, it's an industrial building. I don't, are, are you saying industrial building doesn't have industrial use? Is that what you're asking? Our records indicate that it's 100% leased out as office space. And so I'm, puzzled that you would include that in your lease comp analysis. <clears throat> and so can you confirm that there is industrial space in this lease comp that you're providing us as your lease comp one? Uh, I mean, it's, it's a factual question. Uh, uh, I don't know. I believe it's industrial uh, space. Um, it's highly unlikely that it's uh, but it's office space since the building doesn't have a whole lot of windows to begin with. Regardless, it was advertised as, as, um, uh, as industrial space. Now, um, merely looking at uh, asking rent, uh, generally asking rent for office space may be a little bit higher than this. 780 a square foot. That's Is that a no, you can't confirm that there's industrial use at that building? Uh, I, I, I can confirm from public sources that this space was advertised as industrial use. Thank you. If you'll move on to page 67. I'm sorry, 67? 67, 67. Mm -hmm. The source of your cap rate information was derived from primarily investor and market surveys, is that right? No. How else was your cap rate derived? Uh, it was derived from the sales that were um, um, listed on page 108. Uh, halfway through the page, I show what published cap rates are for industrial buildings. And 
it's uh, it's harder to um, so sometimes it's hard to get cap rates on all of the um, properties, obviously, but um, they range from 3.7, 5.4, 4.25, 3.7, uh, 4.2% uh, cap rates, 10.1 on comp number one. So the cap rate you settled on was an accumulation of both the sales approach that you used and the market surveys, right? That's right. Okay. Uh, speaking of cap rate information, if you want to stay on page 108, uh, it sort of leads to my next question. Uh, sale comp 12 currently has Amazon as a tenant. Uh, wouldn't it be beneficial to provide us with the cap rate of that sale considering Amazon is the tenant and you do have access to the the lease and the net operating income, wouldn't that be beneficial in your analysis? Um, possibly. There's plenty of other cap rates. Right, but that not that in the same city as Simi Valley? Or isn't that in the same city as our subject property? Wouldn't it be a relevant and very accurate cap rate indicator? Uh, very accurate cap rate is, is a misleading term. I don't know what you mean by that. Would it be a reliable indicator of a cap rate information? Perhaps. Thank you. Re reliability. Uh, so that cap rate would also um, um, in involve <coughs> additional research uh, um, and trying to estimate how much uh, extra uh, premium was being paid for the fact that it is Amazon. Uh, but uh, there are other Amazon uh, sales that, that have uh, occurred on this list, and those cap rates are provided. So I don't know what you're, what you're, why are you, why you're hyper focusing on a single sale, and and not uh, uh, paying attention to the other sales. I'm focused on it because it was omitted. That's why. Uh, if you want to move on to page 68, okay. uh, the heading of your income expense pro forma. Yes. Um, can we agree that pro forma cap rates should also be used, considering that is the title of your income approach? Uh, pro forma means market. So, yes, market cap rates should be used. Okay, great. And just for the record one more time, the lease rate that Amazon is paying is to compensate the prior owner for the, the market lease of the building plus the tenant improvements that were installed, right? Uh, that is my understanding. That's your, that's your argument, right? And in no records that you could locate is a division of the expenses incurred by the prior owner and Amazon? Uh, Is that your testimony today? Uh, again, uh, none that I have seen. Uh, it's, it's possible if we dig deep enough, uh, if we re reach out to the prior owner, uh, it's possible to, to get it. Um, I, I don't have access to it. Okay, if we want to move on to the sales comparison approach on page 108. Okay. We'll go ahead and start at sale comp one. Did this sale include any industrial space? This, is, uh, this was an office building, very similar um, to the office building that the subject property 
was uh, uh, before the remodel. Now, if you move to sale comp eight, which is a subject property, it's the previous sale. This did sell as a vacant office building, right? Yes. Did it have you listed on here the building type, office slash warehouse? Did it have any warehouse space at the time of that transfer? Uh, to my knowledge, it had um, several loading docks, but um, nothing significant now. So you would categorize that comp as misleading in your sales grid, at the least? It's not misleading. Why, would, why is it misleading? Because there was no warehouse space. And there was factually no warehouse space in that sale comp. Uh, I should, I should uh, exchange the warehouse to office slash land value. Thank you. And did this sale take place before or after the conditional use permit was before. passed? Do you think that the highest and best use of that property changed when the zoning changed or the conditional use permit was passed? Uh, well, I don't know. Did zoning change? Well, the zoning changed via conditional use permit, so yes. Well, conditional use permit doesn't change zoning. Does conditional use permit change the value of property? It may. Is it your testimony that it didn't change the value of the sale comp eight, which would warrant an adjustment for that change? Um, I made an adjustment for that change. It's 50%. Where at? 50% under conditions of sale. Okay, and how did you determine that 50%? Um, it, it was a very uh, rough estimate. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair, before we go on, uh, I believe there was just a correction made to the applicant's exhibit. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, this, this is submitted under uh, oath, and we had to make sure it's accurate should this end up in court for any reason. So I just want to clarify if there was a correction. Can you specify for the record what page that was? I believe that was the cost approach, wasn't it? Yeah. I'm that, sorry, what? 15, there's been an, a few. Yeah, so any correction, we need to stop and make sure it's clarified on the record before we move on. So there was, it sounded like something just changed where you were changing it from from office to land or something? On the grid, yeah. On page 108, no, uh, yeah. sale comp number eight, which is the sale of the subject property uh, one, two, three. Uh, under the sale price of 16 million there's a heading it's called uh, office slash warehouse okay and we're correcting that to something and, and I believe office slash land slash land okay the official copy for the record has been corrected to office slash land yeah. <clears throat> did you on page 53 under the cost approach that was it, the performing expense. Yeah, it, didn't you agree that at the very top right-hand corner, the cost per square foot should be 5350 50, rather 50, than 50, yeah. rather than 51? That is correct. You right. see that, um, Brendan? All right, so page 53, it's about there, and we're... Right, in the right-hand column, the very top, under distribution warehouse cost, okay. it says 51. Okay. And uh, applicant agrees that should be 53. Uh, 50 and 50 cents. 53.50? Yes. yes. Okay, the official record has been corrected. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just ask if there are any others. We just pause and make sure to correct that before we proceed with questioning. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. So if you want, if we want to move along to. Uh, Sale comp 13. Which page is that? Page 108, 108. Okay. C 
soon as this was what we know now is redeveloped into industrial land, wouldn't this sale comp be more appropriate to be used in the land sale analysis that you had rather than in the improved sales analysis that you have? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I think it's, it's a matter of perspective. Obviously, hindsight, it's easier to analyze. Um, at the time of sale, um, it was a close call. Well, let's go to that sale, actually. If you go to page... What sale comp are you talking about? Sale comp 13. 13, okay. If you go to page 104, and not that we are promoting the accuracy of CoStar data, but it does... And it does in line with what actually happened at that property. If you read the transaction notes on 104 at the bottom, the motivation of the buyer was to re redevelop the property by tearing down the existing building and construct a new building once the tenants vacates at the end of the year. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, so hindsight is 2020 in this aspect. We knew exactly what that sale was, and it was a land sale. And it also has, has it on the banner, sold for land value, on page 104. And the previous page, 103. So did the subject property at 16 million. That sold for land value, but got <clears throat> infused with. So what, I don't know whether the assessor was making a statement or, or, or a question. Uh, a lot of older properties, uh, like I said, go through interim phase. An interim phase means uh, you buy something that 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 you think you're going to redevelop, and then market dynamics change, and and you you stick with the existing building. Sometimes market swings to the uh, uh, positive. And, and your intentions change. And that's the case with the subject property. And that could have been the case with uh, comp number uh, 13. Uh, in that case, the, <coughs> the, the buyer uh, proceeded with their original plan. And so their, their theory to redevelop it came out to be true. But <coughs> uh, uh, when, we're, when we're looking at real estate for older properties, that's it's always, uh, there's always a level of uncertainty. Thank you. I just have one more question. Yes, sir. On page 108, um, I don't believe there are any adjustments made to any sale comparables for location. Is it your argument today that all these sales are equivalent in location when considering the logistical needs of the property and the tenant and the location of the subject property adjacent to the 118 freeway with a almost dedicated on and off ramp? Well, again, that's misleading. It's not dedicated. It's, it's a public on and off I said ramp. an almost dedicated on and off ramp. I mean, that's... <laughs> That's that's a. Are all these sales equivalent in location, like your sales grid would indicate? So uh, um, there's not enough uh, 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 supporting data to to uh, um, to be able to extract locational differences. Uh, based on uh, the rental information, which takes into account, um, I think, more, more valuable aspects of the building than, than just location, such as clear height. Um, uh, I think um, 
these properties are all in very comfortable locations. Um, we could go on a case-by-case -case basis to, to make that judgment call. Uh, from a, if we take a step back and look at these uh, uh, comps as a collective set of, 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 of sales, uh, they're all in the same uh, general vicinity uh, uh, of each other. And in fact, there's a, uh, a, a map showing where these sales are located. Um, they're all, they're all, the location is, is very different. I mean, it's not, it's not dozens of miles away. Is it your testimony that industrial space does not value access to freeways? and how quickly you can get on and off the freeway. That's your testimony today, that logistical space does not, uh, does not value those aspects to a property? All of these properties have adequate access to, real, uh, to freeways. Okay, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions from the assessor's office? Yeah, just a couple more here. Okay. Um, on that same page, 108, sale comp 14, was that provided to the assessor prior to today? Um, I don't know. I did not provide it. You did not provide it. Okay. I did not. Uh, and then lastly, the last line there says plus excess land value. Uh, I, you might have touched on it, but I'm a little lost. Where was that coming from? Uh, well, so the concept of excess land is land not needed for uh, 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 typical operation of, of, a, uh, of a property. And so it's excess land, in theory, it's land could, that can be subdivided and sold off, right, section versus surplus land, which is land that, that cannot be subdivided and, and have a different uh, economic use. Uh, so that land, uh, estimated excess land, is based on um, <clears throat> um, Getting to it. <clears throat> on the calculation calculation made on page 25, so there's 948,000 square feet of usable land, um, less than less 10% for for uh, land that's not usable, which is hillside and, and slope. That's that was included in the assessor's uh, calculation of usable land. And that's just my my uh, rough uh, estimate. I'm sorry, not 10 percent, 5 percent. And then uh, so that gives us uh, 900,000 square feet of usable land, less 290,000 square foot building times approximately two and a half uh, times of land that the building needs. So, so 2.5 land to building ratio, which gives us 725,000 square feet of land that's needed to support the existing building. And so 900,000 minus 725, we get 175,000 of uh, excess land. 175,000 times $20 a square foot, we get three and a half million. Does that make sense? So the, your, the excess land value is the same value as the usable land area? Is that right? Y yes. Okay. Thank you. I believe that I believe that concludes our questioning. Okay. Thank you very much. Does the board have any questions of the applicant's presentation? Yeah. I'll go first. First or last, I'm not sure which. Uh, just a quick one and then get into some more detail. 
when the property sold for 128 million, was there a bank loan or a bank appraisal on that? Yes. How much was the bank loan? I don't know what the bank loan is, but the bank, um, actually, uh, let me rephrase that. Uh, I don't know if there, there is, there is an appraisal on the property. Uh, I don't know if it's for, um, uh, for lending purposes or not. You don't know what that appraisal was? How much it came in at? Uh, I do. In fact, I have it right here. You have that. Uh, you have a copy of that appraisal. Yes. Can we ask to see that, or is that beyond? <laughs> Be sort of interesting information to see. Yeah, that would have been nice evidence. Uh, can we so present the, that as evidence now? The assessor has had the appraisal. So. Oh. Are you oh, are you going to show that a, a later? That will be part of our presentation. Okay. 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 The entire appraisal or just snippets of it? Due to the value that is at um, that is in question here, it's important that we include the entire document for the board okay. the board to review it as as necessary. I just wanted to make sure logistic wise, because otherwise we'd have to figure out how to get six copies of his full appraisal. Right. So, but if, all right. They have it to present, and they've already covered that. Okay. Okay. Um, and then, do you have an opinion of the fair market value of the uh, what the fair market rent for the parking structure should be? Not the one dollar. Obviously, that's not a fair market value rent for that structure. Um, well, that's that's a really hard one to figure out. Um, I think in this case, it, it's irrelevant because there's been a perpetual easement given to the property across the street or across adjacent to it. Um, so uh, any rep I was gonna say, my understanding, just so we're all on board, is if you rent a property for below market rate and a dollar a square foot is, is market rate, you can't get away with not paying taxes, otherwise I'd rent my house to my kids for a dollar a year in perpetuity, and I'd say, you can't value this, it has no value. Well, of course it doesn't, because I've encumbered it. So we so, need to look at what the fair market value, am I, yes. am so, I correct on that with the assessor's office? We're in agreement with you. Okay, so do, again, do you have an opinion of the fair market rent of the, of the so parking the, structure? The value of the parking structure is already reflected in the value of the adjacent property that's utilizing the structure. Because the adjacent property, in order to operate, needs the extra parking. It, do, you so, know, do you know for sure that's true? Can we yes. object to that? That is, um, well, one, not true, and also not part of the uh, property that's under appeal today. Um, he's talking about the value of an adjacent property, mischaracterizing it, um, and also it's not at right. issue today. The subject is not the Bank of America building. So no, but I mean, new. that structure should... But it's, it's, an, well, important, it's an important It's question. important. It is an it important is, yeah. question. That Let's say if it has a $5 million valuation, it's already being picked up on the other side, then it should come out of this value. If it's not being picked up on the other side, then it should be picked up here. We don't really don't know. We know it's being used by the other side, but we don't know where that valuation lies. Well, and uh, let me, I could explain that. So the only way that the adjacent property can attain the rent that they attain for the uh, uh, adjacent property is by utilizing the parking structure. If the parking structure is no longer available to the property adjacent to the subject property, then the rent that they would be able to attain would be lower because they wouldn't be able to accommodate right. the number of people. But so, under, pro so under Prop 13, properties are valued at a certain time. So let's say this property was valued prior to building that, or the appraiser came along and said it had a valuation of 10 million, but 5 million sits on the other parcel. So they reduce that property by five. We don't know. Yeah, there's a number of ways you can handle those. So, uh, and I don't, in fact, I don't know how, how that was handled on the adjacent property. But I, I suspect, again, I don't know, but I suspect the reason it was done this way instead of um, uh, making a lot line adjustment and, 
and and at some point both uh, landlords were the same. And so I think to expedite, to make things quick, they've given them the, the, the easement to use this portion of the lot. And an easement, I mean, that's just like just like a utility easement at your house or I don't know, if folks that live next to high powered lines, right? You may have a large lot that crosses underneath the, the high powered lines, but you can't use it. I mean, you could grow hay, you could run around, but you can't develop it. That's the same concept here. Yes, there's a, there's a structure that physically sits on the subject lot, but there, can't do anything with it. Well, the owner can't do it. It has value. It's just that the owner can't do it, do anything with it. Right, but and that value is to the adjacent lot. Okay. No, it's different than a river. It's a structure that's that's built. So if I build a structure on your on your on your property, you can't come along and say that's not my structure, and then I go along and say. Well, that's not on my property, and so that structure never gets, it has to be valued well, to somebody. I don't know who it's I, I have a structure oh. on my property. Uh, it's, a, it's a utility. Uh, I, I think yeah, I think utilities are different because they're not, they're not assessed the way a privately owned structure. But, but the is. concept is the same. Uh, a utility company came onto my property. The developer gave them an easement uh, for a portion of my property. They put a transformer on my property. Excuse me, do you live in California? Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> and do the same property tax rules apply in California as they do where you reside? Well, we're not talking about property tax. We're talking about uh, appraisal concepts. Well, I think property tax oh, rules. Hold on. Hold on. You need to ask the chair permission to read yeah. open questioning. You can't just start asking questions. So I apologize. <laughs> let's let's just stick strictly okay. to presentations. So, okay. Let's, okay. Uh, so the, the the parking structure it adds value to the bank behind it, and it hasn't. None of these transfers have involved the parking structure. It's been sort of removed from the equation in in all the transfers. So let's just try to focus on the the buildings. Okay. But maybe that's not appropriate. Well. Because we don't know about the evaluation. That we know it's on yeah, sitting on Yeah, but that's not there. the subject of, of this Yeah, area. we know it's on the subject property. Right. But we don't know for sure it's been valued in the other property. Unless that's, the that's up to the other property in a different, it's up to someone else to appeal. Not, not this applicant. Let's stick to this. It has no, okay. no use to this, right. this property. Yeah. It doesn't matter, I don't believe. Uh, well, I no, think I'll, it has I'll, to be I'll valued. I'll take it a step further. It has uh, detrimental true. use because we need to comply with them, the other property owners, tenants, coming onto our property, right? And allowing them egress and entryway and exit points and, and not obstructing. So we can't use certain portions of, of our property to, to uh, its ultimate uh, potential. I, I mean, I, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. I understand what the board is saying. But in in the cost approach, you use the parking lot, right? Yeah. I think you did value the parking lot. So maybe that was a mistake. I don't believe so because I believe it's on your property. It should be valued now. Whether you should send oh, that, so you know, should send that bill to the to the bank is a different question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Uh, I don't. Have, I'm not saying you have to pay that tax bill or yeah. whether it should be separated out, but. In one of your appraisals, it is on your, you did value it. You right. didn't do it, value it on the income approach. I mean, at, at the least well, it's inconsistent. Well, there's no income from it, so, well, a dollar. A dollar, but that's, <laughs> not, again, I, I don't think we can look, we're looking at market. Yeah. You, you don't want us to use well, the, and, and the so actual that, income on, for the whole thing, but you want us to use uh, the, the actual income from the bank, so. I, I, I think any potential income from the parking structure would be uh, <clears throat> would be a captured audience because the way the the subject property is located, I mean, no one's going to park at the parking structure and walk across the street across the freeway, right? It's only to, to that one uh, uh, tenant, and so I suppose hypothetically, if we, I don't, I don't even know if it's possible to. Uh, unilaterally um, uh, cancel the easement. Okay, but let's go, let's go on from the parking structure yeah. then for a minute. 
And I, and I have a, and the board's gonna hate me for this, but I'll do it anyway. Um, I have a philosophical question, and it's one that's for you for this, this moment and for the board when they present their case. I'm gonna call it the case of the disappearing leasehold improvement. <laughs> and we're not gonna use your subject because then it gets into all kinds of variables. Let's use a case where you have 10 shell buildings. Okay, well, did he present on this? We, no, but we I, want, I, want, no, but I want his, his presentation. Opinion on, I want his okay. opinion on, on how you would handle these facts. I'm just presenting this as a scenario because it's okay. a little cleaner than the... But it doesn't have to do with his presentation. Okay, well, let me put it just a different way. There was a substantial portion of money put into the property for the benefit. We don't know. Could have been 100000 could have been 40000 You say you don't have any idea. Uh, for the benefit of the tenant, correct? Okay. And under normal circumstances, when a tenant puts in what are called leasehold improvements, those are billed to, to the tenant. So if, they, if the tenant had paid for this, if they had paid 40, 40 million, 80 million, 60 million, they would have gotten a bill for that. It would have different depreciation than the regular bill, but it's really to, to suit their, so if a bank goes into a shell, they get lease old improvements for everything that's inside. That's separate from the, from the chairs and so forth, but it's built out. Do you think the value of those, since they're reflected in the rent, right? Correct, I think you even said that, right? Shouldn't those be added to a base market rent? Otherwise, the leasehold improvements are not gonna get valued. Uh, absolutely not. And the reason, because, well, I shouldn't say that. Uh, what is the value of those leasehold improvements to the market? Right? Ultimately, no, they don't. They have. They have value. The bigger question is what? Is, what is market value of for property tax purpose of, any, of anything? Right of of the second level uh, where the office portion is, or or the canopy that's that's been built, um, et cetera. And that's what we're trying to figure out uh, by, by our supporting documentation, the assessors, and and trying to reconcile. <coughs> Uh, those uh, attributes that were added to the property, what are they worth to the market? Not to the user, not to the user, because when I'm really thirsty, I'm going to pay $10 a bottle for a bottle of water, right, at the airport. I'm, I'll, I'm never going to pay $10 for a bottle of water when I'm next to a grocery store, right? Because it's, I know I could get it for fraction of the cost, right? So value to a user is very different than market value. We're trying to segregate that. So the way Amazon values um, uh, whether it's worth going into a facility or not is a completely different methodology than, than a spec developer will, will value a, a property. A developer will look at their construction costs, trying to minimize it so they could optimize the rent, meaning lower the rent, so they could attract as many potential users of the building as possible. When Amazon looks at a facility, we calculate how much are we going to save on gas because fewer vehicles are on the road? How much are we going to shorten delivery times because now the products are closer to the customers, et cetera, et cetera. And if the cost is less than the value going concern, value added to, to the company as a whole, then it's worth going into a facility. So the, the motivations are very different. If, uh, so, so are you, do, does that mean essentially that the valuation you have here is for somewhat of a shell building or? or no. The, the valuation is of the subject facility as is to the market, to the uh, typical market user, not a specific user. Okay. 
for a specific user, the, the in other words, value in use may be very different. Just like the investment value that the $128 million was paid for, those that that investment value is very different than someone who would would get the the property in order to lease, to rent out to, to, to market participants. Someone who doesn't have a huge capital gain bill, <laughs> capital gains bill, uh, motivating them to, I, I think it's 60 and 90 days, or, or 90 and 180. Yeah. 40, or, so, so a short period of time to identify and close on the property. Yeah. And, 45 uh, to identify and six months to close. There, there you go. <laughs> Uh, but 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 it's a, it's a sh and so when when you're facing uh, a few dozen um, <clears throat> million in, in capital gains tax, you're very motivated to to pay a premium so you don't have to pay that capital gains tax. And this is so this happens to a lot of real estate properties, just not to this extreme. This is, this is a very drastic extreme where you, you, we had one motivated buyer. And one motivated tenant to use a facility that, to the rest of the market participants, may not have the same value. And we see that because look at all these other properties that have sold, even the ones with Amazon as a tenant, uh, that have sold for significantly uh, lower value. Well, while you while you've mentioned uh, this. Tax deferred exchange. You said he he contacted a broker. Do you know how many bro so at least one broker had this property? At, at least one. Yeah. At least. Do, do you know how many other brokers had? I mean, apparently it wasn't on MLS, but do you know? Was it was the buyer uh, from California? Yeah, he was from California. Yeah. Do you have any idea how many other brokers might have known about this property for sale? Uh, no, I I didn't, I didn't even ask. But uh, I'm sure it's. I'm, I don't know. He could have been lucky and contacted the first one and, and, <laughs> and gotten the deal. It could have dialed for dollars quite a bit. Um, I don't know. Uh, and then you mentioned that part of the um, refurbishment cost, although you didn't know the total cost, was for fast-tracking construction. What, what does that mean? So fast-tracking means... Uh, Again, most developers will minimize cost in order to optimize rent. What that means is, uh, you know, we could redo this room for, let's say, a million dollars. And it's going to take us six months to do it. But we have a hearing tomorrow or in, in three weeks. And we need this done much faster, right? So we're going to pay a premium to get this. We're going to get... Uh, three uh, uh, three crews instead of one, right? We're going to not order uh, supplies ahead of time. We're going to go to the store and, and, and pay at the store, or sometimes even pay uh, a premium to, for, for the products to be delivered faster. That's fast tracking. And that, that comes at a cost. Again, for us, for Amazon, fast tracking makes sense because on the tail end of it, the business value that we extract from delivering products to the customers faster is, is greater than the cost incurred. But mo most most uh, folks, uh, most participants are not going to um, uh, exercise that. They're, they're going to say, oh, it's okay, we could, we could wait another six or eight months and just keep the cost down. Okay. One final question is a small question, but I didn't quite understand it. On page 37, which is one of your comps, the property sold for a million or 11 million. Yeah. And then down below it says 27 million four hundred thousand private lender. Yeah. What's that all about? Uh, I don't know. Uh, most likely, uh, this, so this is a land purchase. Um, most likely what, what happens is, <clears throat> uh, so this site uh, uh, was developed 
at, at some point. Um, and so there was a greater loan uh, 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 secured so the development could start. So they, they paid for the, for the land and then the rest of the money was for uh, grading and, and developing the site. Okay. Plus whatever the, the equity contribution that the buyer uh, contributed to. Uh, sometimes so there, there's another uh, potential where um, the loan is recorded against several properties and, and the loan that's recorded is one larger number, but it's, uh, it's for several different properties and the loan, uh, the 11 million is only reflecting the sale price for one specific property. But I, I, don't, I don't know that those Okay, those. you did. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Do you have any questions? I have a few, I have a few. Um, how come your report doesn't have to be USPAP compliant? Uh, can you repeat that? Yeah. How, why does your report not have to be USPAP compliant? <clears throat> because it's just that. It's a report. It's not an appraisal. An appraisal is a very specific uh, document. Um, uh, I utilize the same uh, methodology, but I've not completed an appraisal per uh, USPAP uh, requirements. Okay. Um. And, and generally, I mean, that's, that's what I have with the uh, uh, landlord's appraisal. Uh, it'll have things like r regional uh, write-up and, and locational write-up. Right, they have a lot more information. And so if it's not USPAM compliant, why should we believe that it's credible? If you haven't done all the work to make it an official appraisal, you've done like half the work and you picked a number, but it's not USPAP compliant. So is it credible? Well, first of all, that's up to you to, ter to determine whether it's credible or not. Uh, I've, I've definitely used uh, the same principles, uh, appraisal principles or valuation principles uh, that are uh, used in the appraisal. Uh, the, the only thing that I didn't do was was the uh, uh, um, uh, additional verbiage or the write-up that's associated with, with an appraisal. Okay, but you understand as appraisers, if we put our name next to a number and we have an appraisal license, it's an appraisal and we have to keep a work file. That's why I'm not acting as an appraiser. I, I advocate for the value of the property, which is very different than, than uh, producing a, an appraisal. Okay, I have no further questions. I just have one question. Go ahead. Uh, number nine, page 19 um, seemed to be skipped in my copy. I didn't know if that was something that was just taken out of all the copies or if it was just missing. <laughs> Uh, yes, I took that page out. It, it produced um, um, Thank job, you. job rolled up image. And it wasn't valuable. It just uh, two extra pictures that didn't make sense. Okay, if there are no further questions, I believe it's time for the assessor's break. Yep. Should we do a five minute bathroom break? Yeah. That's fine. Okay, we'll return at 2.55 and then it will be time for assessors to present their side.
All right, we are back in session and it's time to hear the assessor's presentation. Right. Assessor's exhibit A, A, B, C, D, E, F, and G have been submitted and distributed to your board. Thank you. We'll go ahead and uh, begin on page five of our exhibit A. I think much of the other things have been put to bed. And we'll start down at the bold heading where the renovation began. Uh, I think the board has an accurate portrayal of what the property looks like. Uh, the renovation after the conditional use permit was granted included the first floor renovation of state-of-the-art uh, industrial tenant improvements as well as over 3,000 square feet of supporting office space. Uh, and some of the improvements are listed there. A new roof, upgraded electrical, parking lot improvements, concrete asphalt, landscaping, new, new HVAC and mechanical systems, interior exterior paint, uh, fire life systems, and a 24,000 square foot canopy. Uh, the second floor of approximately 135 square feet remained as partially demolished office space. Um, additionally, there's the parking structure. It is a 195,000 plus square foot parking structure. Uh, the, it was built in 2003. It's always been assessed on this parcel. And according to the assessor's legal requirement, we are required to assess it to the parcel that it currently sits. The lease was signed for $1 a month, as indicated by the applicant. And we do not consider this a market rate for this structure. And there is some reference to property tax rule eight on how we have to treat properties encumbered by a lease. If you go to exhibit A, there's an aerial photograph outlining where the struct where the main building is, the canopy, and the parking structure. Uh, the red line indicates the parcel line. Uh, on that same page are some exterior photos of the building. Uh, we were asked during our site visit to not photograph the interior of the building in any capacity. And so those are not part of our presentation. Um, but I believe the applicant has provided interior photos and we do not dispute with the applicant on the makeup of the interior of the building. The three approaches to value are used, utilized in some fashion. Uh, we heavily relied on the income approach primarily because it was purchased for an investment property and market, the market participants have spoken on uh, how to va best value this property. Uh, first, we've got to analyze the lease. The subject lease started in 2021 in March. It is a 15 year lease, but with multiple ex extension options, totaling 34 years, almost 35 years, 34 years and 11 months. Uh, the lease clearly spells out that it's a lease to Amazon for 100% or the 100% of the building is leased to Amazon. And it's described as 290,220 square feet. Uh, with the exception of the parking structure and some minimal site parking adjacent to the parking structure. Uh, the base rents start at 350,000 a month or $1.21 a square foot or 4.2 annually. Um, all operating expenses are to be paid by the tenant, and this lease is considered a 100% triple net lease based on the assessor's analysis. At this time, we would like to introduce our income valuation. Uh, we accepted the lease as market lease. It was negotiated between knowledgeable lesser and lessee and we will provide evidence to support our market lease rate at $1.21 or fourteen forty-seven per year, per square foot. We reduce this amount for market vacancy and expenses, 
and also reserves. Uh, these expenses and reserves are considered minimal, and I don't think that our estimate differs from the applicants in that way very much. It is a 100% triple net lease, and so there are very little expenses at an ownership level. Uh, the cap rate, the in-place cap rate of the transfer was reported at 3.35, and we agree with that in-place cap rate. Um, but the, the current lease, what we consider market lease, did not address the parking structure in any way. Uh, Amazon, the current tenant Amazon does not have access to that parking structure, and but a prudent owner would expect a return on all value, valuable components to the property. And, but due to the lack of lease data available to accurately value that lease using the income approach, we decided to value it using the cost approach similar to the applicant and add that additionally to the income approach derived from the market lease. And if you go to page 10, there's an excerpt of our cost approach. And the full details of and the support data will be gone over in Exhibit B when we get there. If you go to if you go to page eleven, it's where the beginning of our sales comparison approach begins. Uh, we determined that because of the pro predominant use as an industrial building, that was the most um, likely use going forward and the most accurate way to portray the property when comparing it to other market comparables. Um, as you can see here, we used five sales, all within the Southern California area and considered um, extremely comparable uh, in most aspects of the property. Um, adjustments were made for location, condition, clear height, and land to building ratio. Uh, as discussed previously, the subject property has a significant amount of surplus land, what we consider surplus land, and significant adjustments were made to address the surplus land in the sales comparison approach. And we will go through that a little more in the assessor's exhibit C. Although the sales comparison approach, if we want to go to the reconciliation on page 12, although the sales comparison approach was completed, um, the income approach is a vastly more accurate way to value a property in our opinion. And that's what we did here. We relied on the income approach to value significantly more than the market approach. Our range of values range from 95 million 800 to 129,850,000. Now, if we can go to exhibit B, I'd like to go over some of the approaches to value that we used. If you go to page two is our income analysis, similar to what we saw in the summary. As stated before, we reduced the effective gross income for vacancy and expenses and concluded the value of the property at 117950000 um, plus the additional cost of the parking structure at $11,900,000. The parking structure on page three, valuation, uh, we, we conducted a valuation two different ways on the parking structure and the attached pedestrian bridge. The first approach yielded an estimated cost of 11,900,000, but additionally, we have the historical costs from 2003. And through Marshall and Swift, you can apply a historical cost multiplier 
and as indicated down in the remarks, you can see that the cost would be twelve million five hundred forty-one thousand. So the estimated cost using current cost of eleven million nine hundred thousand was used. My apologies. Page three of Exhibit B. Page three. And if I'm going too fast, go ahead and speak up. On page, well, that was a market indicator, so uh, or not a market indicator. We do have the historical cost from when it was built in 2003. Where is that? What was down there in the remarks? On the historical costs were reported six million three hundred twenty-seven thousand eight hundred in 2003. And so Marshall and Swift provides a comparative cost multiplier that we can apply to historical costs, and that's what we did here. In addition to conducting a at current cost cost valuation and depreciating the current cost. And this was due because there is no there was no market data available for leased parking structures. It was the only adequate way we felt to value the parking structure was to do it this way. If you go to page four, we provide a analysis of triple net industrial lease comparables, including the subject, with adjustments made for market conditions, location, clear height, and the land to building ratio. Um, considering the subject has a significant amount of surplus land. And the subject's lease rate of $14.47 a square foot per year fell within that range, and for that reason, we accepted it as a market lease rate. On page five is a location map of our lease comparables. On page six, we have a, a market analysis that was done by Cole, Cole Banker for the fourth quarter of 2021, analyzing the industrial market for Los Angeles, and more importantly, Ventura County as well. We've highlighted some of the important areas that we used. If you look at the Simi Valley area, the reported vacancy rate was 0.22%, uh, which is considering the time of the transfer was the 2% vacancy that we used was an accurate amount. It accounts for uh, rent loss as well, not just vacancy. Uh, as you can see, the lease rate for industrial properties in Simi Valley was reported at $1.32 a square foot. Um, more broadly, if you go down to the East Ventura that was highlighted, um, it's still within line with the lease rate and the vacancy rate that we used for our income analysis. If you go to page seven, we have conducted a cap rate analysis of industrial sales that we've looked at. with a range of 3.03% to 4.91% for industrial properties. Our in-place reported cap rate for the subject property at 3.35 fits within that range, and therefore we accepted it as a market cap rate. Additionally, on page eight, these are market surveys that are conducted. I believe the applicant used similar market surveys this is for a first tier warehouse property with a going in cap rate of three point, a going in cap rate range of 3.8 to 7. Uh, if you look down at the bottom of page 8, the bottom left, it reports the quarter four 
of 2021. These surveys are often done with the data from the previous quarter. So I think it's important that we look at page nine as well. This is the first quarter data from 2022, which often reports the, the transactions that happened the previous quarter, including our subject property. Uh, and as you can see, the cap rate range ranged from three to 7% uh, for a first tier warehouse, which is what we consider the subject property to be. And moving on to Exhibit C, the sales comparison approach. As stated previously, we used five sales, all industrial sales, all with many similar uh, attributes including uh, tenant, including tenant improvements. The tenant has specific tenant improvements uh, that they like to have put in their buildings. And we felt it most comparable to compare similar build outs to our subject property. In addition to the sales that we used, uh, we also addressed the land to building ratio in the form of an adjustment for surplus land. Our calculation based on the surplus land was that the total usable land is 948,000 square feet, but we added 195,000 square feet for the parking structure. Many times uh, in any office or industrial, any type of building, you are required to have surface parking for your employees. The parking structure fits that requirement. The, the employees that work at this facility, if we're considering the parking structure as available, like the assessor is obligated to without honoring that non-market lease, the employees are able to park in that parking structure, freeing up significant amount of land for to be used either for um, additional industrial development or to be leased out uh, for industrial yard space, which is also a very valuable uh, attribute to this property. It is located adjacent to the 118 freeway. And like we spoke about before, it is, has an almost, almost dedicated on and off ramp to the property. So for logistical purposes, it is extremely valuable. And that can't be understated how valuable the land is that the current property sits on. We made, we made the conclusion that because of the, the current office on the second floor, typically offices are a more valuable component in an industrial installation. Uh, but because of the condition of those tenant improvements, we considered it equivalent with no adjustments made. Uh, other adjustments were made for location. A sale one is located in a more densely populated metro region with superior access to major ports and considered superior in location. Uh, all sales are considered superior in clear height. The subject has an unusual build out in that it has 13 foot high ceilings and no sales that we could find have similar clear height. Um, sale two is right down the street from the subject property with similar access to the freeway. Uh, sale three is a new, newer building and appropriately adjusted for age and condition. Uh, and sale five was adjusted for economies of scale. It was a 700,000 square foot industrial building. And obviously you would pay more per square foot for a smaller building traditionally. And that's the reasoning behind that adjustment. 
on page three, we provide a location map of our industrial comparable sales. And on page four and five, four we outlined and provide the applicant with how we determine the usable lawn, land of the subject property. As stated before, we believe that the usable land is 948,000 square feet, um, but that does not include the 195,000 square foot parking structure, which we calculated as usable land for our valuation. On page five, we performed an analysis of typical industrial land to building ratios of many of the sales that are used in our market approach, as well as other industrial build buildings. And we concluded the average land to building ratio to be 2.27. And that's the, that's the needed square footage of a of an industrial building. Um, and so we performed an analysis to indicate that the surplus land measured about 484,000 square feet. Now to value that surplus land, we performed a land valuation of comparable land sales. This was not added to the market approach. It is only provided to, to the board to support our significant adjustment for surplus land made in the sales comparison approach. We concluded that a value of $50 a square foot for this industrial land is adequate. Like stated, Previously, the subject is approved for industrial uses and logistical, for logistical reasons, is extremely valuable. That can't be understated, that the value of this property is in the conditional use permit change allowing for industrial uses. If you look at our sales, Sale one was a industrial building that was shortly demolished and it sold for all land. It is considered superior in location. It is located in close proximity to multiple major freeways. And for industrial or logistical purposes, it is, it is considered significantly superior in location. Um, all the other sales are considered equivalent in location. Sale comp four was used in the applicant's sales comparison approach. We chose to use it as a sale, as a land sale because that's how it sold. But it is located away from the freeway and considered slightly inferior to the subject property. On page seven is a location map of our surplus land comparables. And if we could move on to exhibit D. This is the offering memorandum that was prepared for the sale of the property. by the seller, it provides a detailed analysis of what the property is. More importantly, if you go to page three in the top left, the investment highlights, it shows that the building is 100% triple net lease to Amazon at current mark at market rents with 2% annual rent escalations. I think that's an important distinction to make. Even the seller of the property believe that it was a market rent that Amazon was paying. And there are some interior photos on the following pages, as well as some 
list of improvements that were made, tenant improvements that were made. and some other market highlights. <clears throat> On the back page is a CoStar report provided for review by the board. And if we could move on to Exhibit E. This is the fee appraisal that was commissioned by the owners of the property, not Amazon, to secure financing. All right. We're not going to delve too much into this document. We will only summarize it. If you go to page six of this document, under the value conclusions, The fee appraiser appraised this as a leased fee property. It is the, with a value conclusion of 128 million. It is the opinion of the assessor that because the property was recently leased, the lease was recently negotiated prior to the transfer, leasehold rights don't exist. The leasehold rights and the fee simple rights are equivalent. Leasehold rights only exist when there is a benefit to the, lease, the lessee. And that is the only disagreement we really have with that market evaluation. Uh, this is provided to be reviewed by the board in the capacity they want. We wanted to touch on the fee appraisal that it did exist, that they did secure financing for the property. Um, but the merits of the evaluation, we don't necessarily stand behind. We, we have our own valuation um, but we wanted to touch on that. Exhibit F is the subject's current lease. And we can go ahead and start on Addendum 1-1. One, one. What page are we on? Oh. We're still on the fee appraisal, right? No, no, sorry. My apologies. It is on the lease agreement, Exhibit F. I skipped ahead. And you want us to go to the addendum on that? If you go to addendum 1-1. One, one, what page is that on? 28, that's right. It shows the monthly rate. which we agree that is a market rate. Additionally, if you go to addendum 5.3, it provides a, and I'll read it, as it's written, tenant improvement allowance. Landlord will pay to tenant the sum of two million nine hundred two thousand two hundred square or two hundred dollars in a tenant improvement allowance. That's ten dollars a square foot based on our calculation, and well within the market to secure a tenant at ten dollars a square foot to pay for tenant improvements. If you go to addendum five six. In the lease agreement, it spells out what work is being done by the landlord. There's nothing in that site work or in the building work would pop out as extremely expensive 
uh, to the assessor's office to indicate some other, something other than typical tenant improvements to secure a long-term tenant. In the following page is some preliminary work, and based on how the lease is written, it is our understanding that the preliminary scope of work is going to be done by the tenant, which is Amazon. And that is all we have for the lease agreement, but it is attached for the board to review as well. If you wanna move on to exhibit F, or exhibit G, excuse me. This is the parking lot lease, and the revenue and taxation code actually addresses this. Um, in the assess, in section 402.1, in the assessment of land, the assessor shall consider the effect upon the value of any enforceable restrictions to which the use of the land may be subject, subjected. The restrictions shall include, but are not limited to all the following. Now, if you go down this list, a private deed restriction that's set forth by two related parties is not on this list. So as far as we're concerned, our job at the assessor's office is to value that parking structure on the lot that it sits because we are legally obligated to. And unless there's a governing body or an agreement with a government agency that says, hey, you can't use this uh, for this reason, then we have to assess it on the property it sits. And secondly, if you go on to page three, is the parking lot lease, or at least an excerpt of it. And it spells out the lease rate that the applicant has stated of a dollar per month, which we conclude is not a market lease. So in conclusion, the simplest way to value this property is normally the best one. Uh, the income approach was given the most weight. It uses the subject owned lease that was negotiated just prior to the transfer and represents the, the least fee and the fee simple property rights. The tenant leased the building at a market rate and that best represents how market participants would view the property. The reported 128 million sale price that was negotiated by very sophisticated market participants, was within the range of values, and per property tax rule two, was accepted as fair market value for the October 1st, 2021 transfer. We asked the Assessment Appeals Board to sustain that value based on the evidence provided. The only change that assessor recommends is an update to the allocation with 47 million to the land and 81 million to the improvements based on the land appraisal provided within the documents. Thank you. Thank you. Does the applicant have any questions of the assessor's presentation? I do. Okay. No problem. Um, now's your chance to ask. If you'd like, they had a whole lunch hour to prepare their questions. If you want to An hour. 10 minutes, you can request it. Okay. But, you know, <laughs> uh, out of I fairness, you, you, can, you know. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I can proceed. Okay. <clears throat> Have you completed an appraisal? Excuse me? <clears throat> so this is a question to the assessor. I don't know who, who would answer this, but has the assessor's office completed an appraisal on this property? Yes, and in, in accordance to the property tax rules that apply. <clears throat> Is it a USPAP compliant appraisal? We are not bound by the confines of USPAP. This is for property tax purposes. <clears throat> Have you 
completed an appraisal of the real estate? Or have you completed an appraisal of leased fee value? We've completed the appraisal for the fee simple and leased fee property rights. Both? Is there a difference? We, because the property was leased just before the transfer, we don't believe that there are any leasehold property rights. We believe that they're equivalent. <clears throat> was the property ever marketed for lease? We could not find any marketing material for the lease. So how do you know the, the lease rate is at market? We performed a market analysis to indicate what the lease rate would be had it been marketed to the open market. Is, is as, that you can, as you can see in our income approach exhibit B. Okay. Uh, let me see here. Page four. As an addition to that question, the uh, seller in their listing memorandum agreed it was a market lease as well. Well, we don't know if that, if that was the seller. <clears throat> um, why did you have to go so far as to Torrance to find rental comps? We believe that this property is uniquely situated and would be offered for lease for many different tenants, uh, primarily in the logistical space. And it was important for us to look at all areas, not just Torrance, but all of Southern California for market participants that would look at this type of property to lease. Who's, who's the tenant of the Torrance property? I believe it's Amazon. And the reason why we chose that sale comp is they did many of the similar tenant improvements. They built a canopy on that property. They, it was a former, it was formerly used as a different type of property and retrofitted similar to our property. And so we felt that it was extremely equivalent in terms of the tenant improvements and the additional canopy space that was put on. So according to the, to the cost approach, the canopy space was um, canopy was valued how much? I think it was two and a half million. We did not perform a cost approach on the canopy. How did you come up with a clear height adjustment? That was based on the appraiser's experience and what the market would react to different clear heights. Uh, the, as the applicant alluded to, the clear height was not a significant issue, obviously, because they leased the building out. And although we made market derived adjustments to the clear height. Uh, I don't believe that the applicant uh, has, a, has a position on clear height cl clearly by the lease that they leased, the lease for this building. I'm sorry, are, are you referring to the Amazon's need for clear height or the market's adjustment for the clear height? Both. Explain, please. Amazon is a large participant in the market, and our job is to evaluate all the market participants, including Amazon. So, so increasing clear height from 13 feet to 25 feet uh, warrants only a 10% adjustment when you nearly double the, the amount of storage space. That is our opinion. Uh, I see you've also used um, rental number th three in Moore Park, 6,000 Condor. That's also an Amazon facility, right?
I'm sorry, is that correct? What was your question? I apologize. I was trying to find it in my presentation. Okay. Exhibit B, uh, page four, uh, third rental car, uh, comp is also an Amazon rental. That's correct. And so is rental number five. Correct. Um, exhibit B, page seven. Uh, you provide a list of cap rates. Uh, the first cap rate provided, who is the tenant? For the property on Condor Drive? Yes. Amazon. What about for the property on Sky Park Drive? Amazon. But what about the property on Prairie Street? Amazon. What about the property on Mission Oaks Boulevard? Amazon. Were there no other sales with cap rates except for Amazon? Well, considering we're looking at a property that is leased by Amazon, we felt it most relevant to look at all the market participants. Uh, you have to keep in mind that at the time, when logistical relevant properties, industrial properties were going up for market, there was an extreme expansion uh, in logistical needs and Amazon was driving the, those market conditions. So like I stated previously, for us to ignore Amazon as a market participant would not be doing our job. It's our job to look at all market Exhibit participants. Exhibit C, page two. This is your sales comparison grid. Sale number one, who is the tenant? It, it says right there, it's Amazon. Okay. Sale number two, who is the tenant? Can I just make this expeditious? Amazon's the tenant for all of the sale comparisons? all the sale comps. If I may, I'd like to add um, that one of the reasons for that is that these properties are of a caliber that would attract a tenant such as Amazon. So the characteristics of a property that would attract a, um, a tenant like Amazon are very good and therefore it is appropriate to compare them to the subject property. Uh, I didn't ask a question, but thank you. <clears throat> On page five of exhibit C, this is a lent to building ratio comparison. Is this a statistically sound lent to building comparison ratio? I'm sorry, will you rephrase that? On page five, yes. you provide industrial land to building areas ratios, so land to building area. And you have seven comparables, supposedly. Is this a statistically sound list of comparable <clears throat> land to building ratios for the market? I believe it gives a good representation of what is the required land to building ratio to operate an industrial facility. And not very far off of your analysis either. We just provided comparable information and not just a summary. Uh, do you know who the tenants are in these set of comparables? Some are some of them are used in our sales approach. Yes, but who are I the can't tenants? I can't speak to every tenant. That was not part of the analysis. The analysis was what is a typical land to building ratio for an industrial well, property. Clearly, there's more than seven industrial properties in the immediate neighborhood. Yeah. 
I can't tell you the tenants of these individual properties. Okay. Although you can draw your own conclusions based on the addresses and uh, the sale comps that we Exhibit used. Exhibit D, there's a sale uh, <clears throat> offering memorandum. Do you know if this offering memorandum was ever distributed to, to the public? No. We cannot confirm that it was distributed to the public. Okay. On but page... It was, I'm sorry, go ahead. <clears throat> I might add, though, that um, the just because it wasn't distributed to the public doesn't mean it wasn't distributed to a small circle of potential investors. On page 8 of the Exhibit D, There is a, a little bit of statistics here for Simi Valley slash Moor Park on the right-hand side. It says base inventory 14 million square feet, current vacancy 2.8%. And then it says 2021 year-to-date net absorption. What does that mean? This is not a part of our analysis. This was generated by the well, sellers. What do you think it means? How quickly properties get absorbed by the market. And, and how much, right? Like I stated, this is not part of our analysis. This was an offering memo. I think your question would be better relayed to the seller of the property who commissioned this document. It also says that asking rents are 83 cents a square foot for industrial space. <clears throat> so typical rental rates are 83 cents a square foot, and yet the subject property at uh, $14 a, s a square foot is at market. How can <clears throat> the subject property be at a buck 20 a square foot while the rest of the market is at 83 cents a square foot. Again, this is a document that was furnished by the sellers. Well, you, you provided sure. it for a reason, so you must rely on it and you think it's worthy. Well, we, we provided attention. it. We provided it in the capacity that it was a real to sale. This was a marketing flyer that was produced and at least circulated to one other broker considering it sold. Uh, but we don't know the full extent of who it was circulated to. Uh, but I imagine they wouldn't put the work into a marketing flyer and circulate it just to one individual. So exhibit uh, follow B. Up, follow up to that real quick. Um, we showed the market data that we're relying on for our lease. This was not part of it. And we don't know where this 0.83 per square foot is coming from or the data they relied on. Exhibit it's simply D. to show that the property was listed. Exhibit D on the last page, it shows that uh, the buyer was motivated by 1031 exchange. And you don't think there was any premium paid for, for, being, for, for that motivation? As you've previously testified, it, many of the properties that are purchased like this, the market participants are all, many of them are involved in 10 to 31 exchanges and are motivated in that way. So I think that would be, it would be par for the course for a 1031 exchange to be part of the transaction. If the assessor were to eliminate every 1031 exchange, that would probably cut the pool of comps in half, if not more. Exhibit E, uh, the appraisal. Uh, uh, completed by the <coughs> landlord for, what is the purpose and function of the appraisal? You would have to ask your landlord it, from reading it. My understanding it was to secure financing, but I can't be I can't be one hundred percent sure that's the only purpose of the appraisal. 
financing. <coughs> Uh, what, what is the reason you provided the appraisal? Full disclosure. We wanted to provide the board with the entire picture of the property and all that went on with the October 1st, 21 transfer. On exhibit E, appraisal, In uh, on page one oh four, the appraiser used a rental rate of twenty eight dollars a square foot. Do you think that's a reasonable rate for the subject property? That is not the rate that we concluded for our value. This is a separate appraisal included uh, for informational purposes and for the board to review and. Yeah. Why, why is there, why do you think this appraiser for the, for the purposes of financing distinguished between market value as is, least fee, and the go dark or fee simple as if vacant value? I'm not sure you would have to ask the person that commissioned the fee appraisal. I'm gonna backtrack a little bit. Um, uh, exhibit A, uh, you mentioned the parking structure, and then you've also mentioned there is no uh, m market rate, I presume you meant market rental rate for the parking structure. Why do you think that's the case? I can't be sure. Um, it would, my opinion would be that would, would number one, either there would be one possible tenant for that property, and it is the adjacent parcel, um, but also it could provide it an extremely amount of valuable parking space for the subject property. And because of the lack of data that for- right. And that's what I'm asking. Why is there a lack of data? Because parking structures are typically not leased at market rates. Not least or not least at market rates? Not least at market rates from what we could conclude. Okay. Uh, on page nine under the income approach, you conclude that the subject rental rate is, uh, is a market rental rate, but was the subject property ever advertised for rent? Not to our knowledge, and that doesn't mean that it was not leased at market rent. Um, all right, and last question. How do you uh, reconcile the two sales of the subject property? For 16 million and for 128 million. I think we did a good job of reconciling that in our presentation. The first sale occurred as a vacant office building, approved only for office use. The second sale occurred after a conditional use permit was permitted or a conditional use permit was approved by the city council allowing for distribution warehouse uses in conjunction with significant capital in the terms of tenant improvements being completed at the subject property and it being leased. 
you just right. said there was significant capital improvements made, but earlier you alluded to in your presentation that very minimal capital improvements were made. So which one is it? I don't think that's a that's an accurate portrayal of my testimony. I think we had always indicated that there were significant improvements made to the property, renovations, tenant improvements. I don't think that we said minimal. We I don't believe we um, testified that minimal improvements were made. To clarify, I believe you are confusing the prior owner's responsibility with the tenant improvements and Amazon's responsibility with tenant improvements. Uh, I believe Mr. Clifford's statement was that the owner's responsibility for the tenant improvements was somewhat minimal, and the and Amazon's responsibility Understood. for tenant improvements was quite considerable. Thank you. Uh, no further questions. Okay. Thank you. Does the board have any questions of the assessor's presentation? I have a couple questions. Go ahead. I just want to um, get some further clarification on this clearance height adjustment and how you said it was by the experience of the appraiser. How does that give you a 10 or a 15 percent um, amount to um, be considered uh, accurate? Well, we used we used what action had taken place at the subject property, the fact that they were able to secure a tenant with that clear height indicated to us that the market participants didn't value the clear height as significantly as we had, we may have assumed otherwise. Even though there's nobody else that has one that's that low? Nothing. That's correct. If I can somewhat restate what he said, um, the tenant, Amazon basically had a build to suit situation. They could have built whatever they wanted there for the most part. And if you look at the work they did, it's quite extensive. They chose to leave a 13 roughly clear height. So weighing that, the assessor found that the tenant didn't find a high, if they needed a higher clear height, more in line with other, the, the other comparables, then they would have done that. They didn't. Therefore, the adjustment was appraiser judgment, and yeah, 10 to 15% seemed to fit, given the fact that the tenant could have made a much higher clear height if they wanted to, and they chose not to. So we're trying to reflect what the market participants actually did. Okay. And we're saying the difference in clear height, yes, that is significant for industrial properties, but Amazon chose not to get that much higher clear height that they could have. So weighing the market participants, we say that wasn't quite as important to the market participants as maybe we would have expected. Okay, I have one other question about the comp number, in, uh, number sale number one in the sales comparison on the location of the property in Carson and the location adjustment on that how did they and how did they determine on that one because Carson is right next to San Pedro which is right next to the shipping lanes which is right next to where everything is it seems like it would be a much more superior than 20 percent and we indicated that there was a significant location adjustment made to that lead or To the, I'm sorry, are we talking about the Torrance property? Or yes, the, I'm talking about the Torrance one. Because you had mentioned I'm sorry, Carson. I meant the one on, in, wait a minute, where did I, where, there was one in Carson, I thought. But, okay, let's just, it was in, I was referring to that one, the one in Torrance. It's close by, I mean, Torrance is right next to the airport, which is. Right, well. and I think our, our location adjustment that we applied to that reflects that difference in location. Okay. That's it for me. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Yes. Uh, maybe I missed it here, but your cost approach, you did one on the, on the parking structure. You didn't do one for the building in general, did you? 
No, we didn't feel that it was necessary. Market participants don't typically use the cost approach, okay. and we didn't feel that it was relevant. How do you feel about the $53.60 that the applicant used? One, do you know, does anybody know how much was spent on re renovating this building? And no one knows, like, a key fact here? Well, it was. it's important to note that um, the historical costs for those tenant improvements were not reported to the assessor's office, even though we inquired for those costs, um, both when the valuation, what the original valuation for those tenant improvements were made and through the appeal process. Okay. They were not provided. And, and then there's a new facility in Ventura, and I suppose there must be other uh, facilities. Do you have any idea what those are costing per square foot? I just granted they're not one in, to one, but it gives us in, gen an, in general or Amazon specific facilities. Um, in general, this this type of facility. Well, for one, the one in Ventura is in the same county. Um, it's another big facility. I mean, if it sold for if it was built for forty five dollars a square foot, that would tell me the fifty three is accurate. If it was built for two hundred dollars a square foot, then that tells me that maybe Marshall and Swift doesn't. Uh, it doesn't have an accurate opinion of the the cost to build in California or in Ventura County, at least. It you would be difficult to shed light on that. Uh, we our analysis didn't include the cost okay. of you didn't have a, other industrial analysis. buildings throughout the county. Okay, that's fine. Sorry. Just to, um, just to follow up on that a little bit, um, if we had that information on those other properties. I believe those would be protected under 441D, so we likely wouldn't be able to share that regardless. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. That's fine. Uh, getting back to this CoStar, I'm, I'm trying to get a better handle on what the heck this exactly was, because it seems to bounce back between an offering just to the buyer and a general offering. So it was commissioned some three months, or this particular documented is three months before the sale, but I do know, well, let's start, who, who is Newmark? Is that, a, is that a, a large firm that deals in, in, in property uh, over uh, 50 million or whatever? I, I mean, if are they go, normally just brokers or are they you specialized to, firms? If you go to Exhibit A in my summary. Exhibit what? Exhibit A in my summary. Oh. In the burden of proof section three on page four, down at the bottom of that. Uh, Newmark is a global commercial real estate brokerage firm that the seller hired to represent them. We just don't know how many places this was sent to, but this seems to be there. There. Does anybody have any evidence that this isn't? It says here if you're going to you have a buyer on the pages, it doesn't have a page number where it shows the the one next to the last talks about if you if you have a potential buyer, you may be entitled to. I'm paraphrasing a, a commission or not. So this seems to be a document that's being sent out. Not to me or to Brian, because we don't have $128 million, but it does seem to be a document that's being sent out to people that have this type of capital to invest. So, I mean, am I wrong? Does anybody? Yeah, so um, a lot of times with commercial and industrial properties, there's offering memor memorandums, and they get distributed to people they know. And it's not necessarily something you or I could look up on any kind of website unless they specifically list it on there. Uh, I've seen for probably the majority of the uh, property types I've worked, uh, the, the offering memorandums usually distributed to, you know, other firms they know, potential buyers that they're aware of, that sort of thing. Um, sometimes these are uploaded to CoStar, and so maybe our larger audience can see the offering memorandums. Uh, but this is kind of the typical way that I know of that these, uh, a, a lot of these types of properties are shared. And the fee appraisal was done 
after the fact was in the documents that were sent to you, uh, what, this wasn't an all cash, or was this an all cash sale that they then financed after the fact, or are they refinancing this? Do you know? We're not sure about that. That was not disclosed to us. Okay. I think that's all I've got. Are you feel, okay. Say, um, on the page mark seven. Wait a minute. Exhibit what? Uh, it would be exhibit D. D. Back to D again? Yeah. There's on page seven a, a little footnote number two in tiny print says, as part of the conditional use permit, Amazon does not utilize the second floor of the building. The second floor contains unimproved mezzanine space. Is that a restriction, a governmental restriction then on being able to use the second floor that should be considered in the valuation? The conditional use permit addresses it by indicating that Amazon or the tenant would have to uh, apply for permits to retrofit that space. Um, and that's how the conditional use permit con considers the second floor. I did have one actually additional question. The purchase price essentially doesn't include the garage, does it? That's accurate. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, I don't think it's accurate. Why would you say that it's accurate? Let them explain it. I mean, I can explain it. Essentially, when you're buying something, and if you, if you, let's say there's two houses, and I want to buy the property, and one house is leased to somebody else for a dollar a year forever, I'm not going to pay any money for that. Isn't that essentially what? Well, I'll state this. That the, the owner bought the fee simple property rights of the property. So in, in correcting my previous statement, we believe that the sale price did include the right, I understand bundle that. of rights. But one could make the argument that it didn't. I mean, if it had substantially more value. I, we don't need to get into that. <laughs> OK. I have a question on Exhibit C, the sales approach, page two. Um, over on sale number five, down, and sale Wait, number five too is- too fast to me for me, Brian. OK, Wait. well. Start it again. Sale five is one of the larger buildings. But it's still smaller than the subject, and it has an upwards adjustment of 10% for building size. And in fact, all of the sales are smaller. This is just the largest sale, and it has an upward adjustment. I'm just curious why. That's to account for the economies of scale. Uh, we believe that if when you buy a 700,000 square foot industrial building, a market participant would pay more for a smaller building. Okay, I was looking at the wrong numbers. Okay, so that makes sense. I'm sorry, did, you, did your question say that no, sale I, five was? I mix up lot size and building size. Oh, okay. Because I usually see numbers that say GLA, <laughs> not, not GBA. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you. I was My like, houses are always smaller than this. So I was, I was that's what I got confused. confused. Sorry, you can distract that question. <laughs> um, I don't believe I have any further questions. Before the board goes to closing statements, I do have a technical clarification necessary that will... Uh, determine. Uh, I just want to confirm, Assessor Exhibit A, page 12, you are requesting the board adjust the percentage of how land and improvements are allocated on this property, correct? That's correct. Okay. And County Council, just for your research and findings per State Board of Equalization. I'm I'm sorry, Mr. Vlahakis. Can you start over yes. with summarizing the, the correction? Because I was flipping pages and I it was uh, Right. Assessor's Exhibit A, page 12, is requesting. You said Exhibit A, page 12. OK. Correct. Is, is requesting an adjustment to the allocation. Uh, the reason I'm asking is the application on Section 6 
um, does not have box G2 selected requesting an allocation adjustment. So pursuant to California State Board of Equalization's annotations 180.007 and 190.008, the allocation can only be adjusted by your board should the applicant amend their application to include that, uh, unless council finds um, that, the, that, that the boards can take jurisdiction over that without amendment. Um, so the question now that the assessors confirm they have requested allocation is to Amazon, are you wishing to amend the application to include an allocation appeal so that the board could do so? Um, or are you objecting to the allocation adjustments? That's, that's, to that's Amazon. a question to me. Yes, um, <clears throat> I I can't make an opinion on that yet. I need to think through whether that's even reasonable. Could um, you please my, repeat? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were done. Do you want the annotations again? That's what I was. Yeah, thinking. it's one eight zero point zero 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 seven and one nine zero point zero 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 eight. So, in summary, and this will be for council to research further, is that the Allocation cannot be adjusted um, unless it's properly identified in the appeal, and that's only within the first four years of a base value being established. So um, if Amazon does not want to amend the application, county council will just have to research before the board makes their decision if they can take jurisdiction without uh, application amendment. If the applicant agreed to amendment, it would be easy. We can just add that. But if the applicant isn't agreeing, I think you're going to have to research it further. OK. OK. And, and so Amazon is not willing to request amendment at this time. I, I don't know what the ramifications are. Um, I... It would permanently establish the allocation of the property until construction or uh, title changes subsequently. So right now, the, it's allocated 14% to land value and 86% to structures. So it would be ch allowing the board to adjust how the well, total is distributed. Yes, no, we, we object to that. Um, the land value comes in. Uh, very close to what the assessed land value is. Uh, I don't think it makes sense to change the allocation. Um, not not to dive in back into the to the testimony. The assessor uh, uh, used very um, creatively land sales that are significantly uh, uh, far away from the subject property, rather than focusing on the sales that are in the immediate vicinity of the, of the subject property, just to arrive at a very high uh, uh, rental rate. I'm sorry, uh, uh, land uh, value. I, that's a long-winded way of saying no. <laughs> <laughs> I, just to be clear here, let's say we, to make it simple, we take $10,000 off of this. That's going to change the ratio somewhat. So is it the ratio that has to stay the same? So your board or can, if, they, if, the, if the board does not have jurisdiction over allocation, you only have jurisdiction over the total assessment. So we would just put the total and then the, allocation the, alloc the percentage allocation would stay the same? Yes. Unless county council determines you have jurisdiction to adjust the allocation without um, the applicant amending their application. OK. So yeah, so typically the board only can adjust the total assessed value and, and less allocations appeal. So uh, it's noted for county council. I just wanted to bring it up in case it was agreeable and then we wouldn't have to look into it. Um, sounds like it's not, so. <laughs> <laughs> And to the clerk, I, I was looking over your shoulder. It looked like you were looking at a letter to the assessors. If you were, could you send me an email with that? Those are the legal annotations from the California State Board of Equalization. Okay. Annotation 180.0007 and 190.0008. They cover the board's jurisdiction okay. and allocations. Um, if I may add, it. It also, and I haven't had time to verify this, um, there's also some information in the assessment appeals manual 
about the allocation of value within a correct total assessment um, starting on page 51. Um, there's several other uh, references to allocation in, in the assessment appeals manual too, so that, that may be a good place to look as well. Thank you for pointing that. I didn't have much time to research. I just knew that it wasn't checked on the application, so we were going to have a procedural issue. Yeah, it, the, by very brief reading here, it looks like it may be okay for supplemental assessments. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that that was reviewed as well. Thank you, Chair, for allowing that clarification. That's all. Absolutely. Okay. Are there any more questions of... The assessor's presentation, okay. Oh, did you get to read that? Was that? I, forgot, I thought I was ready to go. <laughs> no, 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 we got closing arguments. Okay, so the assessor's office gets to make their closing statements first. <clears throat> As we stated before, in conclusion, uh, the simplest way to value the property is as it's currently leased, and that's what the assessor's office has done here. Uh, we didn't, we portrayed the property as it sits. We provided all the relevant documentation, uh, even documentation that the applicant may want the board to think doesn't exist, but actually does exist. I thought we went over and beyond to uh, disclose everything that we had and more importantly, arrive at a market value for the property. Uh, a market value that was negotiated by very knowledgeable buyers and sellers. Uh, you don't complete a $128 million transaction with your, without your eyes wide open. And I think that that's what occurred here. I think that they purchased the full bundle of rights, the least fee and the fee simple rights. And that's how we have articulated our presentation today. And like I stated before, we hope the board um, takes in the evidence that we provided and confirms that the sale price of 128 million was fair market value at the time of the transfer. And I just want to reiterate a very key point in this and that's in our exhibit F, the lease. It's addendum five. Um, the applicant explained, and I tried my best to understand, it sounds like his opinion was the current lease on the property was inflated due to construction costs. And when he explained it, my understanding was these were construction costs that needed to be paid back to the prior owner, and that's the inflated lease rate. I just wanted to point out, this is not what the lease states. The lease states in addendum 5.3, or addendum 5 in multiple pages, the tenant, Amazon, did everything to get the conditional use permit. They did all the permits, all the plans, and they did the majority of the work when it comes to remodeling and retrofitting the space for their use. The only things that the owner it was responsible for, and it lists them quite clearly, was on addendum 5-6. It was repairing the parking lot. It was uh, a new roof, some landscaping, uh, removing some generators, removing mechanical equipment, you know, it lists a bunch of things here, demolish HVAC. It literally, the owner's responsibility was to repair some things, make the roof new, and then clear everything else out so the tenant could do what they wanted with the space. Addendum 5.7 shows the tenant did the remaining of the bulk work. So... That's just one thing, I, key point I really wanted to highlight because it, I think it's uh, integral to the board's decision today. Um, and with that, I think the assessor is done. Thank you. Okay, it's time for the applicant's um, closing statements. 
Thank you. I think that was a mischaracterization when uh, Assessor's Office stated that they provided information that if <laughs> the applicant wouldn't want the board to see. That is not true. Uh, and I don't know what information you, the assessor's office is referring to to begin with, but uh, all the information that was provided uh, <coughs> to the assessor's office uh, uh, with the expectation to review and to value and to uh, recognize that uh, there is a difference between fee simple value and least fee value. Value in use to a particular user and value to the market as a whole. What the assessor has done in their valuation was value what the property is worth to Amazon. And this is clearly evident by the comparable sales that they've used, not a single outside uh, sale. Uh, it, this would imply that only Amazon properties are selling. There are no other industrial properties that are selling in so far as to go all the way to Torrance to, to find yet another Amazon sale. That is by definition least fee or investment value that they're valuing and not value of the fee simple because there's plenty of sales of other industrial buildings in the, in the nearby vicinity. Uh, you saw that from the taxpayers' information provided. Similarly, with uh, land value, right within a mile of the subject property, there was a handful of industrial uh, lots that sold and, and, and at, at the top end at 20 bucks a square foot, but the assessor's office chose to go all the way to Silmar, all the way to these remote locations just to find uh, land sales that would support their higher or inflated land value. Uh, similarly with the, with the rentals, not quite as much. They've put in a couple of rentals that are non-Amazon, but nonetheless cherry-picked uh, 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 rentals when other industrial properties in close proximity uh, were, uh, uh, were available for lease at a much reduced rate. And so all that's to say that the assessor's office done a great job figuring out what a least fee value is, uh, but that's not the job or the focus of our presentation today. The focus is what the value of the real estate is to the market as a whole, not just to Amazon. And, uh, and that is so fundamental to, to figuring out value of real estate. Uh, just as I was uh, saying earlier, a value of a bottle of water to me at an airport when I'm thirsty or in the desert when I'm, it's very valuable, but it's not as valuable when, when I'm ne next to a grocery store and I, I don't want to drink water, right? And so just because someone is paying a top dollar for, for uh, a specific property, that doesn't mean that that's the market value of, of that, of the, of that uh, real estate. Amazon has a business case that that allows it to command and, and, and pay a premium in order to get the locations or, or the properties that they want because, uh, because it's supported by the business. Uh, <clears throat> the rest of the market doesn't, doesn't approach real estate in the same manner. And, and we see that by, by both the, the rentals and, and the sales of other real estate uh, that was not purchased by, by, by Amazon. In fact, the, the paired sales, one year apart, one, subject property is a great example, 16 million, just after you get a provisional, which by the way, the word provisional uh, is specific to uh, Amazon's use, not to any industrial use, only Amazon's use. Um, so if, if another industrial user wants to utilize uh, the facility, they'll need to get yet another <laughs> permit to use it as an industrial building. But that's, <clears throat> that's secondary. Um, every, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a principle of, uh, 
the, the assumption is, by the assessor's office, that the only potential user of the facility is, is Amazon. In fact, the whole marketplace is, is just used by Amazon, and that's, that's what they valued, and that's incorrect. In fact, the appraisal that was provided, albeit for financing purposes, even the fee appraiser recognizes that there's a difference between there is a value in the lease and there's, there's a going dark clause. I, I would argue that the rental rate that he used at $28 a square foot is a little high, uh, both as indicated by the data provided by the assessor's office and the taxpayer. But the appraiser recognizes there's a difference. The assessor's office makes an assumption if it, if, if a rental rate, if a lease was signed, therefore it's at market. Um, <clears throat> and same thing with uh, the purchase price of, of the subject property, $128 million. There's nothing else in the, in the anywhere close that's sold for that much. In fact, to the next closest uh, dollar per square foot basis, the assessor had to go all the way to, to Torrance to, to find a sale. Well. <clears throat> If a, if a user needs to use a facility, that typically is very uh, specific to a location. There, if I'm looking for a facility in Simi Valley, I'm going to look at in the greater neighborhood of Simi Valley. I'm not going to go to Torrance or LA or Riverside to, to potentially uh, have the same business case for those properties. And, and so that's that's, not being adequately uh, recognized. Lastly, <clears throat> the assessor says there is no, uh, there is absolutely no, and both buyer, buyer and seller were uh, um, institutional grade sellers uh, uh, participants, and and therefore they they wouldn't be. There's no possible way they'd be under duress. Well, when you're under a time crunch in the large transaction that requires you to invest 100 million plus dollars and there isn't a whole lot on the market, you're, you're under duress. You, you have a huge tax bill uh, uh, before you and in order to, to not pay it, you need to uh, enter into a deal. And, and that's what the, the, the buyer uh, committed to. Um, but mo most, most uh, uh, buyers that are not subject to those conditions, they, they, they would, uh, they'd probably ask for a much higher cap rate, which is what we were trying to do at, at a four, four and a quarter cap rate. In fact, all of the cap rates that the assessor used, also Amazon cap rates, the assessor doesn't recognize that a tier one tenant has any premium in the marketplace. But in fact, it's, by the evidence provided by the taxpayer, uh, uh, multiple all the mul multiple uh, sales included cap rates from a non-Amazon uh, buyers, which are significantly higher. And so there is a premium. There is there is a difference between leased fee and fee simple. There's a difference between value in use that Amazon is uh, uses the, the facility or for the purpose and function versus a, a typical, uh, uh, typical market participant. Lastly, <clears throat> uh, the whole concept of, oh, well, clear height is 13 feet and therefore Amazon used it. Therefore, <laughs> there's no uh, substantive difference between uh, 13 foot clear and 24 or 35 foot clear as some of the comps had. <sighs> utterly ridiculous. Over the last 20 years, building heights, and we see this in brand new construction, building heights have been increasing for the sole purpose of increasing cubage for storage purposes because it's easier to go up than across. When you go across uh, the ground floor, uh, A, it cost of construction goes up, and B, it takes more time than uh, you shrink the square, uh, uh, ground uh, footprint and you go higher, uh, you have shorter distance to travel from loading docks to the storage shelves and going up. 
And, and that's been valuable. I don't know how the assessor's office can say that with, with a straight face and say that there's no difference in, in clear height just because one market participant rented it for, <coughs> rented a 13 foot clear uh, height uh, space. We ask the board to recognize that those differences do exist and, and, <coughs> and they're clearly evident in the information provided by the taxpayer that, that least fee value uh, is something greater than the fee simple value. That is all. Okay, thank you very much. I think at, see, at this time the board will take all of our evidence and proceed behind closed doors. We will inform Brandon of our decision later today if we get that far. And Brandon will inform both applicant and the assessor's office when we have it done. It might take him a couple days or a little more. I don't want to commit him to anything. <laughs> I know he's busy. Um, so on that note, I believe court is adjourned for the moment. Uh, no. no. Wait, we have one more. Yes, but uh, we're all up. done with the Amazon case. So yes. uh, we, a few have popped up. So item 140, um, this one we had trailed, item 140, application 2310636. Um, we had trailed because we had a nondescript <coughs> email from the applicant um, indicating medical issues. Um Based on that, um, they're agreeable. They've requested to continue to May 6th. They've agreed to provide the data to the assessor in the next 30 days. Um, this was a no confirmation case, so they had not previously confirmed appearance or reached out to the assessor um, before making their uh, medical continuance request. Uh, so at this time, the requested action is to continue to May 6th, 2024 with the proviso that requested data be provided to the assessor in the next 30 days. It is a um, watercraft, and they have been provided with the assigned okay. appraiser's contact information. Unless, um, so that's the requested action, unless the assessor had comments. No comments. That's I so good. move. <laughs> Perfect. All right. <laughs> no, I was waiting for Brooke to just shake her head no, and I was going to go for it. <laughs> you were fast. Is there a second? Give me, give me just a second. You're moving too fast for me to document Sorry. that. Uh, was that moved by board member Sisk, second by board member Freno? Yep. Okay. And no objections to that. All right. Um, item 145 through 147, your board had previously denied due to lack of appearance. Um, I got some unfortunate um, text messages regarding a severe medical situation. Um, we've, they've provided sufficient proof that there's a issue here. So the requested act, um, I also was able to um, converse with the applicant um, due to the medical circumstances. Uh, this one is, would be recommended to continue to June 10th. Um, and because of the ongoing medical situation, they're agreeable to provide the assessor with the outstanding data at least 30 days prior um, to that date. Um, and this is another non-confirmed appearance that we did not hear about from until uh, mid-hearing today. So requested action is to vacate the denial and continue to June 10th with data due pre 30 days prior, unless the assessor had any comments. No comments. Mm -hmm. I so move. I second. Okay, you got it. So, okay, cool. 10th due. All right. Sorry, just documenting and clarify. It was Sisk that made the motion? Yeah. And second by Croft? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, final item on the agenda is 150, I think. Yes. Yes, it is well, 150. Well, I know 149 came back. They've decided to agree to the stipulation, but we're going to save that for another date be, since your board already continued it pending the objection. So 150 was trailed, um, but there's um, some issues with the submitted paperwork. So um, I think most likely the, the admitted stipulation is invalid, but we haven't informed the applicant of that yet. So I'm going to say... Let's continue item 150 one more time to May 6th, pending resolution of the issues with the stipulation, <laughs> because the one that's signed uh, cannot be approved. Um, okay.
So I guess at this point, it's just a request to continue item 150 to May 6th. Okay, I so move. I second. Okay, cool. All right. And now there's no other items of business for your board on today's agenda. Yeah. All right. Court is adjourned. <laughs>